In a podcast world where everyone is gray plastic, there is but one clown fiesta, and it is the podcast known as Trapped Under Plastic. The miniature hobby podcast where we talk about sprues and do, baby! Woo! It's only but a goodie. Speaking of do. Speaking of do, you crack you can crack cold one right yeah. now? I got a, I got a Mountain Dew Energy here. Tropical Sunrise. Hey! Uh, I don't have fingernails, so... Do you never have fingernails? How often do people comment on your videos being like... You need to you need to up your fingernail care game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was my channel was young, I got that a lot. Now people just accept me for who I am. <laughs> just accept your stubs for what they are. Yeah, you don't worry about my nubbins. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was uh, Thanksgiving in America a couple of days ago, which means that it was Black Friday the day after. Did you pick up any hobby uh, deals? I did not. No, I didn't either. I um, I was looking at video game deals. <laughs> Yeah, you got that. Uh, what's, what's it called? Like cheap gamer, cheap ass gamer, uh, is a website, and they put out a sweet ass spreadsheet every okay. year of every game and every store that has a sale on games. I just okay. scrolly scroll them with toles. That, that is nice. Uh, but not. I didn't even buy any of those. You know, I didn't buy anything. You didn't buy I, a goddamn thing. I was so like stressed out about my own. <laughs> Uh, Black Friday sale of selling the dice trays. Yeah, yeah. Can that, you see like, that? Do you got one on you right now? Yeah, I do. Let's see this packaging. Yeah. Did you was so did Norse Foundry do the packaging for you? Yes, they did the packaging. Here, Look at that. It's, it's up. This one apparently is upside down in the packaging. So the packaging looks like this. Glossy. And then on the inside, there's the tray. This one is this one is uh, hand, being hand delivered to Dan the man, Danimal, because uh, we're gonna see him today, and he ordered one. So I'm just gonna. Give it right to his little 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 thingies. What does that service cost? Hand delivery. Um, sixty nine dollars. Yeah, sixty nine dollars. Sixty nine hey. cents. <laughs> sixty nine, sixty nine. <laughs> um, but uh, as of the recording of this, there are still some remaining on the website. If you wanted to pick up a Ninjan limited edition Slate of Grey dice tray, limited edition that design will never ever available. Yeah, once this this is a limited run. Once these are gone, they this at least this version. Or maybe dice trays that I ever make ever will be gone forever. So yeah. um, the whole pr process was a fun learning experience in a stress. I was just going to ask, yeah, how was the physical product fulfillment process? Um, not all the way done, but last night I brought uh, close to 100 down to 100, 100 down to the post office. And so that felt good, and I feel like we're really getting a groove in the old home front. Yeah. Um, my daughter is... is Packing them. You in put the her to work to yeah. what is yeah. this child work? What? Yeah, this is this is something that actually my accountant recommended I do. <laughs> I'm calling the local authority. Yeah, dude. because apparently your your children, if they work for your small business for it's a limited number of hours that they can do over the course of a year, yeah. um, that it, you pay them that that money is all tax free as long as it goes into a certain kind of account that can only be used for college or buying their first home or there's a number of things they can use it for that is sick actually yeah so it's um it's tax free for them so okay. i put her to work putting together boxes and putting dice trays in boxes and put the packing tape on them all right okay thank you us government and i will never say that again regarding taxes yes. so you better fucking savor it yes Fucking whoever our president's name is. Some, I like they have anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I have anything to do with it. Well, that's cool. I'm glad that worked out. You sold like, a lot of them. You got a couple more to go. Yep. That's yeah. good. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a little, real quick story that's timely. Okay. Um, this morning driving up here, this is, that was the first for me. Okay. The first in the history of, of Trapped Under Plastic uh, drivings. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had to stop. <laughs> Halfway here, pulled off. Oh no! Pulled, had to whip into a quick trip <laughs> gas station and do the high speed duck walk. <laughs> yeah, do a little quick dip, quick into the end of the shitter. <laughs> I was sweating. I was like, I'm not gonna make it. <laughs> oh, I'm no. not gonna make it. I had some hot ass hot wings last night for dinner. Yeah, and then something about cracking a do, and it just kind of like. It set everything in motion. Just loosened it all up. Little did I know, I was I was it. That was it. Uh, the was... fate of John's life was decided then and there in that in that right. bathroom. Right. So and that like kind of like hit me in this moment of realization. Like how many times in my life have I been like in a gas station, 
you're waiting in line or whatever. Oh, and you see somebody. It's almost always a dude. <laughs> they are like they come in with some sense of urgency. <laughs> 99 times out of 100, that sense of urgency has to do with dropping a deuce. Yeah. It's coming ready or not. 100%. Yeah. You know? It's going to go in a sink if I don't have a toilet. <laughs> yeah. Know. Or, yeah. It's just like uh, along the side of the road. I've had that <laughs> moment a time or two in my life. Like, if I just pull over and shit in a ditch, <laughs> so I, be it. I've never had to do that yet. I haven't had to do it, but I I've would absolutely about do it. it. Yeah. If yes. I needed to. Yes. I've done, I've Wait, spent enough time this, out. In- this question was asked on our podcast by a historical guest. It goes by the name of Jake. Jake? The curtain engineer. Oh, yeah. Curtain <laughs> engineer Jake. You remember this fucking... The, the rest stop bathroom washcloth <laughs> <Yeah>. conundrum? <laughs> like the great moral moral question of 2019, whatever that was. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. was great. Yeah, this was it was like a it was like a scientific mind experiment <laughs> of what do you choose if there's no TP. It's like Jake DeGrasse Tyson, <laughs> if he was a fucking <laughs> curtain engineer. <laughs> All uh, right, on Black Friday, I got... What'd you buy? I bought some... I wanted uh, 5.1 speakers for my home theater setup for a long time. I've had 2.1 forever. So I bought a center channel and then a rear left and rear right. Oh, uh, baby. From Polk. Polk Audio. Then Polk. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also bought a bunch of stuff for the office. A big old RGB LED light that's super bright. I bought uh, a new network-attached storage device that can fit eight hard drives and I bought four 18 terabyte hard drives, and I'm gonna huck in my other four 12 terabyte hard drives for just a buttload of storage that I can, because I'm running a little bit low, and some like other uh, bits and bobs. Mm, man, that's shit. You, you don't go through and clean out that storage. You take a shovel to it, and you be like, "What do I need? What can I scrap?" I do that every now and then. I'll look at like I have a directory of like. Um, finished videos that I've made that I export in a certain way. And sometimes I'll take a look and be like, why is this one like a hundred gigs higher than the rest? And then I go and find out it's got a bunch of proxy files in it and then I delete them. Yeah. So every once in a while I do a little bit of spring cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. I go through and a nice thing, I'm, I'm guessing it's the same way for yours, but your um, the location where it saves your proxy or optimized media files is all one folder. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm like, Oh God, I feel like I got so much data here. I go through and I just, crank that out and i just delete all that proxy optimized media mm-hmm. and it's like oh man that's like 75 percent of the the storage that's used is from that yeah this is some this is some boring back end <laughs> conversation y'all don't care about yeah. what do you what do you do with the literal terabytes of video footage that you've accumulated over years of youtubing yeah it's like it's a it's a logistical problem you don't really think about as a viewer yeah yeah you buy file folders you put it in a file you put it in a physical folder and you put it on a Shelf. Yeah, then you mail it away. Yeah, it's gone forever. Oh, forever. Yes. Okay. I um, did you get in Teletech? I always get those Black Friday and Teletech emails. Mm. It's like, hey, 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 you need a twenty seven hundred dollar light. <laughs> it's only twenty three hundred dollars this week. <laughs> and I'm like, I look at it, and I'm like, I don't need it. I still have two more. Fuck, I still have two more of those lights. I haven't even put up yet. What? Because I got two um one by twos. Um, over the shoulder. You know, over the shoulder, increase your light output while you're you're painting yeah. stuff. But my current setup is not going to work. Um, do you need more of those like special fittings? No, it hasn't. Doesn't have to do with the fittings. It has okay. to do with my my ceiling height and the, that location. You couldn't physically then walk around my painting desk if they were up. Um, gotcha. But uh, no, yeah, I got, I got aperture and Godox lights this time around. Oh, yeah, I got them Godox. Mm-hmm. Good cheap lights. Yes. Okay. I have. Some, do I have something else? Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about v- fucking VinciCon 2022. Yeah, I talk about VinciCon, and I want to talk about your your Age of Sigmar escalation. Ooh, me, me v. Dan? Yeah, so Dan you- Dan Molson, manager of the Source Comic Games in Rogue, Minnesota? Yeah, rock enthusiast. Yeah, <laughs> big time rock enthusiast. Okay, so you you guys have moved up in points. So this is your first game at, was it 750? 750. Okay, so you went from 500 to 750. That's a 50 percent increase. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> That's how math works. Yeah. Okay, so it's your first game. So first of all, what did you change and what did you or what did you add here? So army? you helped me mm. craft a delicious list. Mm. I, love, uh, I love me some list building with oof, undead, dude. Yeah. So I, I I threw in another unit of blood knights because goddamn they're good. Yes. I mean, okay, I looked at a competitive. Uh, AOS lists on AOSshorts.com yeah. Yeah. Uh, for Soul Blight, and no one loves Blood Knights. No one loves Castellai. 
They all love fucking zombie spam and grave guard spam. Mm, yeah. But so I don't know if Blood Knights are bad, but man, they feel good. <laughs> uh, so I got a second unit of them. I got a unit of 10 grave guard, which holy shit, they're amazing. Yeah. And a unit of 10 skelly. So I dropped the wolves in favor of grave guard and skeletons and then threw in a new unit of blood knights. And that was 750 exactly with a vampire lord commander. You only have the one hero. Just the one hero. That's the way to do it, man. Dude. Lean and mean. Yeah, exactly. At 1K, I'm going I'm to throw in the necro for Van House. Oh, yeah. But at 750, dude, Crimson Feast plus Graveguard. <sighs> got a 12-inch motherfucking charge. Oh, I, no. Okay. AOS is so dumb. <laughs> how, how is my 4-inch fucking moving unit charged 12 fucking inches? It's like all of a sudden the skeletons just go fucking ham. Yeah, dude. So they, yeah, they sprint in there, Crimson Feast, 31 attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on fours, sixes are bonus mortal wounds. Bonus. Not not the attack ends. Because yeah. there's two different kinds of mortal wounds on yes. attack rolls in this game. And one is shit and one, well, not shit. One is far superior to the other. Yeah, dude. Just extra mortal wounds. And uh, yeah, Dan's unit of the pistoliers evaporated. Oh, man. He, just like old-timey humans stand no chance. <laughs> no chance. My white blades. Yes. Um. So, yeah. I didn't feel like I was super tactical. I kind of ran down mid and killed everything. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, his army... I mean, because there's a lot, the cities of Sigmar, there's a lot of different ways to build it because they got 7 billion units to choose from and all mm-hmm. those sorts of different cities. Mm-hmm. You know, was he Jacksonville this week? Who knows? <laughs> Denver. <laughs> He's Denver this yes. week. <laughs> and uh, he was like, uh, you know, but most of them, unless they have like some some tough halberdier boys and stuff. Um, he did. You get you get in, in the, the squishy midsection of those Humies, they stand no chance. Yeah, baby. He was a can and my army was a can opener. Yikes. I opened it. I just saw that tuna inside and I just fucking ate it up. <laughs> Kobayashi. <laughs> yeah, we were playing the one. I forget the name of the scenario, but it's the one where you roll a D6 and uh, the objectives in the middle change what they're worth. It's like if uh, you roll one, two, three, four, or five, six, yes. one becomes two objectives and stuff like that. It's, it's like shifting priorities or something like that is the rule. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, he had a pretty good alpha strike idea with his pistoliers because they can move 12 inches, shoot, charge, while they're charging, shoot again, and then swing in combat. And so he got 10, 20 shots, uh, maybe some amount of melee attacks against my Blood Knights with two units of pistoliers. And after all that happened, I had three Blood Knights left out of five. I felt so bad for him. Like, uh, I mean, you could look, you got to look at the numbers on the pistoliers though, because they're like to hit and dam or the to hit to wound, rend and damage amount. Yeah. None of those are great numbers. No. So what you're paying for is the abilities to shoot, mm. charge and shoot, yeah, and then hit. So you're you're paying for weight of dice. Yeah, and I use all at the fence too, and so Yikes. it's like. I'm rolling Space Marine saves. Yes. And I, I rolled pretty well, and yeah, they were all left, and then they uh, ate them alive. Oh, my God. It was good. It was Man, massacre. <laughs> Blood Knights are great. I love Blood Knights. Did they heal some stuff back then, too? Yes, oh, did. God, it hurts. <laughs> Just adding insult to injury. It hurts. There was like one left on one wound, and he healed the belt back after yeah. uh, the hunger. Yes. Yeah, it was a good game. Um, next one is against actually the same exact faction of Cities of Sigmar. It's called Hallow Heart. Hello, hot. And then after that's 1K points against Curtis's uh, Daughters of Cain, which for me has been the other big scary army to play against because he has ways of just amping that army just so many times. Yeah, make make him make him run into skeletons. Okay, you're gonna yeah, want to have yeah, at yeah. least least two units of skeletons. Yeah, the 1K point I was I was messing around. I, I can't I can't figure it out. Like you cracked the code for 750, mm. but I can't. When you toss in that vamp that that necromancer, he has like a weird point total, and it, it hard makes it hard to kind of jive up with the rest. But I'm figuring it out. Yeah, you tell, we we can massage it. Okay, we'll massage it. Yeah, yeah. You, you make him make him hit the things he doesn't want to hit, and then right. you will your counter strike. Because his stuff melts, but it is a whirling blade of death if yes. it's if it instigates. Yeah. So that's what, I, that's what I've seen against him against other players. He just annihilates everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of um, it's the kind of list. It's the kind of army that does really well against people that aren't privy to all the minutia of the movement 
phase and positioning phase. Mm-hmm. And it can have a feel bad moment. If you're like, we're going to put, I'll put my guys down. You put your guys down. You know, we'll meet in the middle kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. His, his meeting in the middle is not equal to yours. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He brings the fucking hurt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would like to see him go against like a heavy duty, um, Nurgle army or something, which shit just does not die. And then when you swing at him, um, with all these attacks and Nurgles, if they roll a six on their own save roll, it does mortal wound back. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like he eats you back in the process. Mm-hmm. He will. He'll, he'll be playing John's Nurgle at some point. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll get to see that. See that in action. But yeah, so far, uh, fingers crossed. I'm three and zero. You know what? I'm I'm, I'm I'm killing it right now. Gosh, from the games I've seen on stream, Grant, I I didn't see the one with Dan on stream because I don't think you stream that. But I did like, not that one. The other ones, if I were to like just randomly watch a thirty minute portion of the game at any time i f- would have figured you were losing <laughs> yeah against uh evan i was definitely losing in the beginning 100 percent. but then yeah i brought it back eventually it can, it can feel that way and that's the one thing about the game that i i do appreciate maybe i i don't because you're in the midst of the game you're kind of not able to stand outside yourself and just kind of see the, mm. the things that are happening mm-hmm. of i i value the ebbs and flows a game can have in that without it feeling like it's a catch up mechanic. Yeah. Um, it just feels like, oh, the, the it it kind of the tides can turn and it's like, that's not so easy to do in a game, you know? No, to have comeback mechanics that like don't feel bad um for the other players. Right. Right. It's like, oh, I outplayed you, but this game's mechanics just allowed you to come back yes. with no skill involved. And there is that in Age of Sigmar, uh, namely in I'm going to roll for VPs and if I roll better, I get more, you know? Sure. So there's a little bit of that, but that was also the other thing that you're describing as well. Yeah. Yep. And just the, the way the game is, is balanced in the, the strengths and, and stuff of armies. Certain armies have a better ability to absorb a, a mistake or a good roll by an opponent or a, just, you know, you're going to have to take it right. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, going against like those, those orcs that, that Vince played, that have that can just scream across the table and smash into you. If you can close your eyes in a and and not <laughs> not open them again and see everything removed from the table, it's like, okay, I'm I'm not all the way dead. Yeah. Let me crawl back into this. It's like it's like Helm's Deep, you know, Gandalf's just over that hill, bro. Yeah, just, just hold out. Yeah, we just we just hoping that them el- them elves show up on <laughs> yeah, the third the, day. Jesus Christ, we need them. <laughs> we need them, goddamn elves. <laughs> Um, last thing I want to talk about in the preamble ramble is our upcoming Vinci con. It's Woo! Be, yeah. So by the time this episode goes live, we'll actually be probably, uh, waiting at the airport to come back, to come back. Yeah. Um, or we'll be there for, for a while yet on Monday and then midday, we're going to head back to the airport, something like that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you and I haven't had a, a, a sit down chance to talk about like, about the event because there's so many things have been going on for both of us yeah. and it's kind of come up on us and which is why I think it's important for not only us but for all of you to like take control of scheduling something you really want to do whether it's going to a convention whether it's setting up a hobby weekend whether it's scheduling regular games whether it's having a regular hobby painting hangout night with friends and stuff like you have to be proactive in setting that up because otherwise just life gets busy and things like if we were left down to like, okay, we're going to schedule, are, are we coming this week? Uh, are we driving? Are we, should we buy plane tickets? It probably wouldn't have happened. No. But, uh, you know, good thing we got uh, Unky Vince to, 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 to push us to say, hey, guys, tell me, buy your tickets. Yeah. This is the weekend. Awesome. And then we, when we do it. So awesome. what are you, uh, what are you thinking? What are you, what are you excited about? What are you planning? What do you want to do? So I know that the majority of y- y'all are going to paint stuff for Golden Demon. And I know that Vince's mantra about that is like, if you show up to Adepticon or whatever event and you don't have something to paint, you're going to feel bad. And that may be true, but I don't want to paint a competition model right now. Full stop. And so I've been thinking about this lately and I'm kind of like, I want to do something that's going to make Scott right now happy. Not yeah. Scott in the future happy at the expense of Scott right now. It's obviously a little bit of like a, the reverse because obviously if I'm happy now but sad later, then it's the same situation. But right now I'm enthusiastic about playing games. Um, and so I'm going to bring my unit of 10 3D printed Graveguard. I want to get through that whole unit. 
And then I would like to, I kind of wanted to paint a necromancer, but I want to convert one. And I don't know if I'll be able to do that at his house hmm. uh, or do it before we have to go. Mm-hmm. So in that case, I was going to start doing my next uh, 1,000 point list to see what I'm going to add and then bring that second unit. So if I can get through two units, whew, that'd be so fucking nice. That'd be so nice. I'm just about done with my second unit of skeletons that I've been painting at home. Um, so I don't need to bring those guys. They'll be done before I leave. But yeah, so I'm going to paint uh, stuff for my armies um, and I'm, I'm hyped for it. No, oh. And yes, you probably need to be prepared for a little bit of friendly ribbing about that. <laughs> probably. Absolutely. I'll, I'll take it. Mostly from mostly Vince is going to Vince is, is he can't he can't uh, not do that. <laughs> And and I'd be saddened if he did, <laughs> but I I also think like he will respect and and you know not not push it too much. Oh for sure. I mean I don't even care if he does because um, I'm confident in you know what I want to do. Yeah. I'm excited about AOS and a Song of Ice and Fire. So I don't pay those minis. Yeah. And and I think and, and I might say something too. Just please, because please not, do. not right this moment. Right, I mean, no, I'm, right now. I'm just gonna. I'm all about the the hog pile, right? Like I'm just <laughs> oh, gonna yeah, jump yeah. on when Vince says something. I'm gonna be like, hey, this is my top opportunity. <laughs> say something too. Um, and and here's here's where I think, and I would say with 90 percent certainty, where Vince is coming from, and I come from a similar position. And it's this. This has been said to you before. You have the ability to win a golden demon. Your painting style means a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and the quality and crispness of your work is is absolutely what lines up really well and can win. And so I think where you're going to hear the ribbing is because we know you have the ability to. We just want to see it happen. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> that said. <laughs> It is so much work. Yeah, it really is. And it's not even about the work. And cuz I'm I'm in this uh, a weird spot and I'll kind of explain mine in a second. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's so many hours. It's not about putting in the work. I you have the ability to do the work. It's the finding the hours and being cognizant of the this is what I'm giving up for this 150 hours Mm. between now and end of March. Yeah. And is that worth it for your own overall happiness and what you want to do with your life at this point where you're at? And that's that's it. Like and and for as somebody that is is painting full time and making videos full time this last year, I feel more like in touch with how you feel on this than I ever have before. Bro. It's, it's hard to commit yourself to it. Yes. Yeah. And especially like, I I think you recently talked about like painting models for sponsorships and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and how that affects your enjoyment of the hobby. And it's kind of the same thing. It's like, I've really had this thought where it's like, I'm not going to do anything painting wise that I don't want to. Yeah. Like period. Um, because it's like, it's like, it's like Roman Lapot philosophy, right? Right. It's like, don't, don't force yourself. But like if the, if the joy is there, then follow it. Um, now there is something to be said about like buckling down and really putting in your all and being, feeling very proud and, and pushing through those hard moments. Like there's definitely something to be said about that. Um, and that, that, I think that time will come for me for sure. Yeah. I, yeah, and, and to not push it. And so what I'm planning on doing is I have my diorama all built. Mm-hmm. I started painting one of the zombies. Mm. Um, shortly after I finished the the one we're going to talk about and what we painted, um, because it was so fresh in my, my mind of this painting style, and to get m- another quick turnaround rep in t- bringing some of that style into my kind of how I paint regularly for what I would call like high level. Um, and also pushing myself um, from a time perspective because this whole diorama is about a dozen models. I can't paint them at least getting ev- getting paint on everything to the level that a single individual Age of Sigmar or Space Marine needs to be painted to. You don't need to. <laughs> 
And so I needed to like, what is my, what does this balance look like for speed and for quality mm. to get everything to an 80% done? Mm. So my goal is set to, I want to get everything to 80% done by like end of middle of February, beginning of February, something like that. Um, and so I'm going to bring like four, I think four or five zombies or zombies slash skeletons. And my goal is to get all of those 80% done at that over those days. I love the idea of starting with the zombies and the skeletons to kind of just like cut your teeth a bit. Yeah. Um, I, I would do the exact same thing, kind of just figuring out how that OSL effect, like the moonlight thing you had going, I was going to work yeah. out and all that stuff. That's a great idea. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of nice because of the section of the models where that, that lighting change is big. Um, you're, you're just focusing more on getting the values correct and the light intensity correct and not so much about getting all these tiny little details because it's basically in blue, black darkness and it's building up to almost like the, the teal haze of that blue. Mm -hmm. um, so that should hopefully help me, but it's really tricky when you're dealing with a, a source light that's over an entire scene with that many models of like, is it all consistent? How does it feel? How is that going to affect how I paint the environment? Is it all going to feel in line? And that's where it's like 80%, baby, let's get it to 80%. And then like everything in there, I can kind of tweak it to make it feel good. But awesome. I also don't want to push. I felt like when we did the last one and I painted um, my piece for Golden Demon there for a lot, it helped me a lot. Basically, it ensured that I was on track to get it done for Golden Demon. Yeah, like this is a good chunk of hours. Like yeah. We're going to paint like 16 hours a day. Yes. And I made a commitment, and you heard me say it, and I'll yeah. say it here right now for all the, the GPPs. I'm going to paint as long as Vince paints. Yeah. If he's painting, I'm painting, period. Yeah. So as soon as he puts his brush down, that's why I go put, my, put mine down. Okay, yeah. So he, I hope he doesn't take that as like a challenge or he's like, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to tell him that. I mean, whether or not you tell him that, it's up to you. Yeah. But that's my little secret goal to myself. All right. I won't tell him. Uh, I mean, there's a chance he may have heard through the great rhyme from your stream. Where that, you oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. But I'm not going to say anything for at least the first day. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. Or, you know, because we're going to get in on a Thursday. I think. I will commit to not saying anything and see see if he whether or not he notices. I'm as much like curious to see how, if he ever picks up on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until Saturday. Okay. So you got the rest you get the full Thursday, the rest of our evening there, and then full Friday. Okay. At least I'm showing up on Friday. Oh, that's right. You're showing up on Friday. Yeah, you're you're going Thursday. I'm coming a little bit day, a little day later. Okay. So I got a, I got a whole day you getting whole, zombies done without you. Whole day. Uh. Okay. So yeah, it's about that balance of like we're also there with friends well, obviously you have fun and we hang out that yeah. alone like you don't have to like schedule play time and stuff we're gonna have to do fun stuff so yes that's yes. the really nice thing ever this is like the this will be the fourth vinci con if we count the first one at your place the second one with all of us the third one that you didn't make it to this will be my fourth your third mm -hmm. we have enough of a rhythm now of like knowing how it goes mm -hmm. and it just kind of like just the motion of the ocean baby mm -hmm. it just happens i'm excited to see what uncle adam's gonna do I, I he's he's just gonna crank out stuff and have fun i think i'm curious if he's gonna like paint forever though you know if he's that kind of person who like wants to sit down and paint a mini for you know 10 plus hours he eats snacks Walk around Vince's basement, play on his uh, uh, Steam uh, handheld console. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He'll yeah. probably have his 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 hot hotness of the the Steam handheld switch looking thing. Steam Deck. That's what Steam it is. Deck. That's what it's called. Yeah, he's. Yeah, oh, I'm not worried about Adam. He's going to keep himself entertained and keep us entertained. I fully expect that he'll at certain points he'll just perform a monologue um, that we'll be painting. He's like, I want a little break from painting and he'll just talk about something interesting. Absolutely. And I'll be there for it. That's his gift. Honestly. Yes. He is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just, he's just a great person to listen to talk. It doesn't matter what he's talking about. He'll talk. Yeah. So I think this was an Olympic record for preamble ramble. Oh uh, shit. Uh, yeah, we're at 32 minutes. <laughs> Fucking killing it, bud. <laughs> All right. I know what we painted, um, which might be a little bit, hold on. You said, Willow in the preamble ramble, and I can't move beyond that. Did you see the Willow show? No, uh, dude, I haven't Disney seen Plus. it. I haven't seen it either, but I saw the commercials for it, and it's up next for our Wednesday night show nights after we finish this season of The Crown. We're switching over to Willow, baby. Dude, because I last episode too. we talked about fantasy, fantasy show. Yes. And this Did you is read all the comments. 
I, I, I saw some, uh, and, and some of my patrons came to my defense on the how shit Wheel of Time is. <laughs> yes, there is that. But boy, Rings of Power haters are loud and oh. angry. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, they're... Uh, they're they're uh, raising the fucking they're they're in, like in their bathrooms putting on the fucking Urukai war paint. Yeah, like, dude. Oh, oh, we hate this. Yeah, dude. Yeah, like they're. Yeah, I think they're. My favorite comment was, "Well, I know where to not take TV show recommendations from." <laughs> um, yeah, I'm like, that's what we talked about. This this there's a there's a scale, and the further you get into the nerdy stuff that we love, the more the blinders come on. For the quality of uh, of a show, you know, you 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 give a lot of free breaks. Yeah, right. That's true. Like for instance, right now, a show I'm kind of working through is an older show, and I wanted to watch for a long time, but apparently, suddenly now we have HBO Max or what HBO Plus or HBO some shit. So I started watching True Detective. Oh, and so starring the great Woody Harrelson in Matthew McConaughey. I don't know what. What I said, why I said it like that. You kind of look East East Coast. Yeah, um, that show's fucking phenomenal, brother. It is so good. It's oh. like a movie. The whole thing's like one long movie. Yeah, it's it's like if Seven was a mini series. Yeah, and I'm for that. Yeah, it's so it's so good. And so while I'm watching this, and I'm kind of sitting back last night and watched another episode. I'm kind of retrospective of our discussion about fantasy shows and stuff. I'm like. If this like this quality of writing and acting, whatever, was in a fantasy show, bro, forget about it. Forget about it. <laughs> like it's like it's so much better. And so there you go. If you say, "Well, you we don't trust our TV show recommendations," True Detectives, it's fucking amazing. Yeah. If you're like, no, it's not, then, then you don't know TV shows, <laughs> or well, you I just don't like really disturbing under your skin. Crime drama. Yeah, that's true. You know, which I, I understand that. Yeah. Great show. All right. I don't know what we painted. What did you paint, sir? I, I painted uh, Acadian. This is uh, one of the new models from the Astra Militarium. Militarum. Acadia Stands box. Just a standard dude. Standard dude. And I love these just standard dude models. These new ones, they're good. And they're like the subtlety in how good they are. I just appreciate like the level of detail, the amount of gobbledygook, the the quality of the the sculpting of the fabric. You know, it just it's just right on the the crispness of the details without being overly detailed. Like it feels like a very detailed model, but not over designed. And I painted it to the I found the official Evie metal recipe of how to paint those. Just like in your backyard when you're kind of digging it up with a shovel? Yeah, yeah, I found it. It was like, like paper, and you're like, holy shit, what's this? Yeah, there's a human skull, <laughs> and then there was a small metal footlocker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And inside that footlocker was an old rusty AK-47 and a scrap of paper. A couple of mints. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, and so I, I, I painted it. And we're talking about, like, you're not going to paint things that, you're not excited about and it doesn't not passionate for you to paint. And this 100% falls in line to me as something that just super excited me to do because I really just wanted to see, to know this is the process they take and that if I was good enough, mine would look like theirs and to not put the pressure on myself to make it as good as theirs, but just like enjoy the process knowing that there's not some hidden data points that that hidden data point is the reason why mine isn't as good or mine doesn't look like theirs just you know behind the curtain what is the wizard like kind of a thing and so um that was like uh probably six ish hours i think maybe not quite that many hours paint job i mean it looks great i think you put this in a unit of these guys that look like this and took a photo of it and put it on gw's website no one would know yeah, I, I I stand behind like how close it is to their um, heavy metal army paint um, quality, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not like the it's not as high a quality as their like their heroes like when they really push those. But I also know that the heavy metal team they don't paint everything equally in terms of amount of effort, amount of time, or whatever. So. 
I didn't put in 40 hours on a guy that wouldn't get 40 hours by their team. Yeah. So you, the only difference really was when I watched the video was the skin tone. Mm-hmm. Um, and also you went a little bit heavier on the scratches than they normally do, I would say. Yeah, I, I agree with that. They have some in there, so I I uh, did that because I saw that they have some of those as well. But I was like, afterwards, I was like, I put too many on. Yeah, that, they're like super subdued with like the scratches they add yeah. to their space brains and things. Where I put them was also in a spot, on, especially on the shoulder pads, where I think they showed up a little bit more. I'm okay with the final look of like yeah. looking a little bit more beat up. Absolutely, but yeah. It, that I, I completely felt the same way. I was like, ah, I, I do that over again. I wouldn't have done it that way. But also, like once you do that, the amount of work it takes to get back. Yeah, it's not going back. It's not going back. Yeah. Be careful. It yeah. looks great. Honestly, it looks great. The scheme's really nice, too. Pop quiz, how many uh, satchels does he have on him? Satchels. Like little bags. Little, bags little and pouches. Bags. Yeah, but pouches. That's a great word for it, pouches. Do you count the pouches that are like pouches on the backpack? Do those count as extras? Or is it just all the backpack counts as one? The backpack has several side pockets and yes, other pockets. Does. Pockets on pockets. I won't count those, but there is one that is like kind of attached to the backpack, it's but it's back. really its own thing. Yes. Yeah. So if we don't count those, I'd say he has f- four more. You're right. He has four pouches, a canteen, an extra grenade, and a backpack, and a roll. You, Bed roll. You said... He didn't have a lot of gobbledygook, but I kind of think he's got a lot of gobbledygook. Like, why I do I need the pouch under his gun? I can't even fucking see that one. I got to paint it still? Yeah. Well, because these are kind of modular. I could have used an arm that doesn't mm. have the gun in front Oh, of are they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's hot. Like, all the arms and stuff. And I had him doing the grenade one. Um, someone said that the the way I pose the grenade looks like he's going to bowl it like a bowling ball. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's fucking funny. Yeah, dude. I didn't think about that that way. But I put that arm in a lot of different poses, and that actually felt most realistic because how you throw a grenade is like an arcing throw yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and that that angle of the arm looked right, and it felt natural. He's like just about to start turning it. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. It looks really nice. So I was happy with that. What'd you paint? I painted uh, my other 10 skeletons. Uh, they're almost done. I have to do the bone highlights and the red highlight, but then I painted one for the video that's coming out about this unit. Um, and I, th- I haven't added the time up yet, but I think that was 45 minutes of painting, not, in- not including like mixing paint in my airbrush and like cleaning my airbrush and stuff like that. Um, and you've seen these guys before, uh, that's the same exact scheme. It's actually not the same exact scheme. It changes a little bit. I can't help myself, man. Whenever mm-hmm. I paint a fucking model, I, I always change something about it. So even in like this video where I'm like talking about, my defined scheme for skeletons. I'm still fucking with the the process a little bit because um, I can't help myself. I th- I think that's not only healthy, but that's probably ideal in how you continually you know, like naturally evolve in a way that it doesn't feel like it's a big crashing of the waves, right? Like it just happens organically, especially when it's something like this where it's like this is obviously high quality, but it's high quality um with the purpose of it being for gaming. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's like tabletop. It's like my version of Tabletop Plus, or yes. whatever you would call that. Yeah. The one thing I'm not so sure about is on the other unit of skeletons that weren't from Curse City, I painted the backs of their shield contrast black, and that didn't really matter. Obviously, it's brass. Like, the whole thing is metal, um, but that, that, that was, wasn't as easy to paint and took a little bit longer to base coat that whole flat area, and so I just painted it black. And you can't really see that part on most of those guys, but there's a couple miles in the Curse City skeletons that just a giant black void. And so it's kind of like, yeah. uh, I don't know about that. Did, did you notice that? Did that kind of distract um, you? I noticed it, but it, like because I'm looking at all these other things, like I, um, it almost like fades into, I don't know, it fades into kind of nothingness. The only thing okay. that I would probably do is I do a little overbrush with whatever this cold is. Um, just around those pits, and try to just mm. scratch around them, and you'll get this like little, a little bit of a glint of a scratchy edge highlight. So it like, it tells the eye that there's something there, but only that is hitting it because that's where the there's a little, the bottom half of that little pit is. And yeah, you can do that in, in just a couple seconds, you know. But 100%. that that's, I mean, I don't doesn't because everything else is you have a really vibrant eye catching colors on both that blue of the armor and the bright red of the cloth that it's just kind of fades into the black background. Nice. That's good to know. Um, one thing that I, it's not really much of a discovery, but it's like 
as a younger painter, this would be a discovery to me. Um, when you like read a paint plan and it's like highlight the bone this color, you assume that you would just do the same step to every part of the model, mm -hmm. but you don't need to do that. So, for instance, for the gold portion for his scales on in his waist, I I layered that on with a uh, uh, fully opaque necro gold, but for a shield. I dry brushed it on. And for other people who have more ornate things, I overbrush it on. So depending on the detail and how important it is and how it's sculpted and where it is, like how easily accessible it is, stuff like that, I will apply a different painting technique but using the same paints, you know? Mm -hmm. So for the bone, I base coated that with an airbrush. Um, and the only area where I do it zenithly and try to maintain the shadows is his head. Yes. Everywhere else, I just spritz it with white a little bit and then wash it in blue and throw stop on a highlight. But so it's, it's like I am, there's variability in each step, depending on what part of the model it is, how important it is, what color I'm applying, how easily accessible it is, stuff like that. I'm not sure if that's much of a revelation to you, but it was to me. And I was like, I don't have to, if I had to layer the gold onto this ornate ass shield, fuck that. Fuck that. Yeah, exactly. So that is, that is as close to you'll get on a GW model to what we'll talk about in the main topic today, what I would call um, 3D printed micro details that you can't paint effectively. I know, right? Like no one, you could layer in here, but it would take you a long time and you'd fuck up a lot and to redo recess shading and yes. redo highlighting over and over and over again. I would take me at least like two and a half hours, which yep. ain't happening on a shield. Right. A skeleton. On one skeleton shield. No. Yes. In yeah, the way that you did that was ideal. Like how right. it, it you, you catch all the stuff. You you get even get a fade because of the direction you used in the in the dark undercoat. That's, that's the airbrush. Yeah. I add a little bit of blue shadow. When I do the blue shadow on the torsos, I do a little bit on the bottom of the shield too. Yes. To, to assist that dry brush a bit more. Yes. You get that that nice fade into it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that intermediate shading with an airbrush using a dark color that if you get like overspray on another part it doesn't matter nope. it's all shading like right. i'm gonna start doing that more i think yeah and that's that's the kind of thing that the biggest hang up for doing that is every time i do it i get that great feeling and then the reason i don't do it as often as i would get the value of doing it is just the hang up of having to pull out the airbrush mm. and to have to go through and clean the airbrush and, mm. and all that kind of stuff but you see a lot of high-level painters use that kind of technique a lot. Yeah, yeah. Like, for more specific reasons, too, for, like, blending, like, big areas and stuff. Yes. I don't do that so much but because I'm not very good at it. Um, but I might start looking into it, looking into it more, kind of integrating the airbrush at more intermediate steps instead of just at the beginning. Yeah. There is something so extremely moist <laughs> about finishing a well-painted mini with a base. Do you feel me, John? Oh, I feel you, Scotty Poo Poo. <laughs> I love me that final aspect of like pulling your whole model together mm. with those little details on the base that makes it feel done. I agree. I love basing, as evident by the myriad of basing videos on my channel. And this week's sponsor, Gamers Grass, is hooking us up with some extra basing sauce. This year, they released a whole slew of new laser cut and pre painted paper plants. Gamers Grass has you covered with a wider range of flora that are both real plants, like agave and bracken, as well as weird and strange ones, like black magic tarot and the alien flytrap. To top it all off, laser plants have a glossy finish that allows them to stand up to some water damage. I mean, you can paint these if you want to customize them further. I used them on my Novitiate Kill Team, and they were the perfect ratio of effort to outcome. Scotty, that sounds a little bit too good to be true. If I'm being totally honest, I thought that too when they first sent them to me. Paper plants seem like they wouldn't mesh well with our models, but for over 25 plants at around 8 bucks a sheet, they were a great low time and money cost option for those that aren't looking to spend forever on their bases. You just pop them off the sheet. You can bend them to the exact pose that you like, glue them down, and bam, you're either good to go right there, or like Scott said, you can just paint over them to match the rest of your basing scheme. They've also got helpful tutorials for each plant on their product page of their website or their YouTube channel. So if you're a basing noob like James, our writer, all the information is easily available for you. 
Gamer's Grass also has a battle ready line. These are completely done and painted bases for you. So if you have a crap load of stuff to paint and you don't want to also worry about having the perfect basing scheme, well, they just have it all done and ready to go. Lovely folks over at Gamers Grass have also asked us to encourage you guys to check out your local game store for Gamers Grass products. On their website, they have a special tab dedicated to finding their stuff locally so you can support your game store. I love it when a company supports local stores in this way. That's super awesome. So whether you love to slap at a base like Scott and I, or you kind of dread it like the writer Goblin James, Gamers Grass has got you covered. A big thank you, Gamers Grass, for supporting the episode. You can find links to their products both locally in your area and also online in the description below. Now back to the episode. All right, today's topic might be a little bit of a weird one for us to discuss. 3D printing. John, kick us off. What are we talking about? Yeah, so I had this thought lately, um, and, and I thought this would be a good thing to talk about on the, the podcast because lately you and I have done a fair bit of heavy lifting in the 3D printing world at home. Yes. And we've had a number of years of experience now with 3D printing, mm -hmm. each of us, using a variety of different printers. And we've seen the evolution both from the hardware side as well as how the community, how these other companies that make uh, models to be 3D printed, how that's evolved as well. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of feel like we're at a new point where we got some stuff to talk about uh, the state of the union of 3D printing. All right. And about where we think it's going, but more importantly, where we're going to try to make a heavy influence <laughs> on where we want it to go next. Oh, that's okay. that's my like inner thoughts for this. I'm trying to change this boat slightly off course. Okay. All right. I like this. This is a good conversation. Yes, I've been doing a lot of 3D printing, a lot of tinkering. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm still in this stage of learning a new task where whenever I go back to it, it feels like I'm relearning it to a certain mm. extent. Are you kind of at that in that place? Hey. Yeah, I feel like um, it's like when you, you got some reps in a thing and you learned a thing, but then based on how much time you take away before you go back to that thing again, you kind of regress a little bit. Yes, definitely. Um, but but not so much so like you're starting over because you have enough general experience in it. That mic came for you, yeah, bro. Dude, that, the mic was just kind of <laughs> like go down my throat. Like, yeah. la, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Oh. It has a mind of its own. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Robots are taking over. Uh, and so, like, you have enough experience in it to where I, I feel now where it's like my hurdle of, like, jumping back on the horse is a lot a lot easier. It's easier every time. Yeah. So, at this point in my 3D printing career, I've owned seven different printers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yes, I've owned seven different printers by three different manufacturers. But John, you hate 3D printing. The, that's apparently they don't know that. <laughs> that information isn't widespread enough to stop these Chinese companies from just sending John printers on printers. I, I guess. I, Do you have all seven in your fucking house? No. Okay. I have four in my house right now. Um and one of them uh, like three is a magical number for me. <laughs> no more, no less. <laughs> Four is right, right out. <laughs> and so I started, the first printer I had was 2K, a 2K resolution printer. So I have, I've now printed at a 2K, a 4K, a 6K, and an 8K. Wow. I currently, the three that are gonna be my, my structured three right now are all 8K printers. Um, but oddly enough, the DLP 6K any cubic was arguably the best quality one in terms of when dialed in, but it's because it was that DLP screen technology. Mm. From from those of you that, were, if you're old enough to remember, when the DLP technology was a thing in TVs. Mm. So it's the it's the backlight mirror system, but they could make them much thinner, um, and it was much more at the time monetarily. Um, you could get more screen for your money compared to when plasmas. And LCDs were all new. Plasmas, dude. Oh, man. Get that fucking plasma, bro. You get that Pioneer plasma for like $18,000. Yeah. It's a 55-inch. And you leave the TV on one night. You just get burning. Burn in. You're, you're sad. Dude, when I worked at Best Buy, we had a Pioneer. I'm not shitting you. It was a $9,000 55-inch <laughs> Pioneer. TVs still cost that. Like like upper echelon ones still cost like nine grand. Yes. Um, 
usually a lot usually they're bigger than 55 oh like yeah, 60, yeah, yeah 65 is kind of the it's like an oled 80 inch tv yes yes yeah. that, that samsung goodness yeah. high, the highest end samsung's um that fucking thing uh was burned in like a motherfucker <laughs> it was so burned in and it was like a I can't remember what was burned in. I'm pretty sure it was Jason Bateman's face from like uh, uh, season one Arrested Development or something. <laughs> Don't even turn the TV off. It was his awkward face. Uh. It was just like Shadow Man. <laughs> it was like Shadow Bateman. <laughs> At the end of the night when we were closing up, we turned all the TVs off. It was like Shadow Bateman came out to rule the Best Buy <laughs> over dark. There's some great like- On every TV, this is Shadow Bateman. <laughs> yeah, bro. This is some sweet ass fanfic backstory i'm creating right now for yeah. for shadow bateman in the in the best buy nighttime but anyway um yeah i don't know what that's to do about anything oh a dlp is there's a dlp printer anyway i don't know if that's gonna catch on because it's more expensive like that than than the lcd for them yeah so we worked with different manufacturers you've worked with different companies and then you get a whole other variable of fucking resin itself oh man um and in tuning in the machines and getting them to work correctly and one of the first things I'll say that over my experience of working with the machines on the machine side is, um, and I didn't put a lot of thought into, but it totally makes sense for anything else we deal with in our in our everyday life, in that a a product or a tool that's required to complete a physical task, which this is 100% doing, it is completing the physical task of creating a thing from sludge to hard resin model, right? The engineering and quality of components to be tuned and tightened to do that task best cannot be understated for a consumer product for a consumer product yeah for a normal ass person just to use it and work yes it's incredible um and so where i found this when i'm looking at comparing which printers that i i think are better or worse um it's in the construction on that fucking Z axis, baby. Those rails that are on, you have a double wide rail. Yeah. So like, there is no like, there's no structural like integrity is never brought into question because if that needs to smoothly go up and down and calibrated to the tenth of a millimeter in how it works, there can't be any shifting or anything like that. And so, like, paying a bit more money, it's a hundred or two hundred dollars more for a printer that is is heavy duty construction and the grand they're all made in china but some are better than others to to get a higher quality machine like this is the kind of thing i think you wanna you wanna spend your money spend more money rather than get a deal mm, okay. that's what i think yeah all right i mean i think for me 3d printing so, like, in, on the spectrum of science to art, mini painting is firmly in the art category. Yes. But you can you can kind of make it a science. I know I like to, I like to try to. Three mm -hmm. um, D printing is firmly in the science yes section, but there is a little bit of art to it and how you place supports and stuff like that because that isn't a science. It kind of is and kind of isn't. Well, um, the printer mm -hmm. itself is pure science. Yes, where it gets you're in this weird wave of either side is the actual design of the minis and the the support of the minis the orientation. Of yes, it. Yeah. all those kinds of things are are more art. Yes, it? so it's it's a weird kind of dichotomy here. Yeah, it is. Um, but I I have the kind of personality that can really go crazy with this kind of stuff, and I really want to. Like, I really want to know what's going to get me the highest quality 3D print. If I want to paint a display model, what's going to get me the highest quality 3D print that is also durable for a gaming model? Like, what's the the lowest exposure times for those things? Is it a mixture of resin? Because you can mix resins, you know? Uh, with uh, Lychee, the slicer that I use right now, when you make a profile, it uploads it to the cloud. And then you can see people that use that profile and they report back if it worked. And so, like, mm -hmm. you can, like, find higher upvoted profiles. And I was using a brand called Resion. And I saw a profile for Resion plus Sriatech Blue Obsidian, both resins that I have. One is more of a tooling resin and one is more of a detail resin. So add them together, best of both worlds. <coughs> but there's so much that goes into it in terms of like the science aspect. Like, and I go down the rabbit trail so hard sometimes. I was watching this Southeast Asian guy, I think his name is Denny's on YouTube. 
and he takes the black tape off of his printer at the bottom and replaces it with uh, that orange tape called Captain Tape that you see on electronics all the time. It's kind of translucent and orange. Oh, sure. Um, and he does that because that tape is like significantly thinner, which allows for the VAT, the FEP, to get closer to the screen and reduces this issue called compression, which happens where if you print a model at, say, 100 millimeters tall, it might end up 99 millimeters tall. So everything gets scrunched a little bit because you are so close to the build plate. So when you give it some more space um, by using a thinner tape, you reduce compression. And like there's all these, there's so many tinkering things. The the brewer's belt I told you about yeah. that I, I love. I love it so much. And it can be really easy to get caught up in that so much. But I have to remind myself that this is more of the side bay to mini painting the main bay. <laughs> but I want it. I want to dig deep. It's it's such a thing for my personality to want to dig deep into that. So I love that part. And when we get into um, the actual miniature design for uh, um, for 3D printing, that's when we'll enter the salt bay. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about, but I'm excited. <laughs> uh, so to me, one thing that I think I have noticed has come a, a long way, but we're still not there. You can dig down that rabbit hole that, that you're talking about, and I think there's still much more room to improve, is to make a truly out-of-the-box workable product um, because we assume that's what this is. It's like a fucking toaster, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Take yeah, it out of the box. You plug it in the wall. You put it in the toaster. You push the button down, and it's not. They are getting close, They're though. getting close. Like you, you use Frozen's resin and their exposure profile on their printer, and how fast did that work for you? Was it instantaneous or was it not? Yeah, that's a good question. So I have a I have a Frozen Sonic 8K Mini and a Frozen Sonic 8K Mighty. Oh, how big is that guy? Uh, the Mighty is is like I don't know. It's like one of the bigger build plate size. Yeah, yeah. and the Mini is smaller. I the Mini. I had to do like one. The only tweaks I really had to do with, with the mini right out of the box is tweaks because I went from 0.05 ohms. <laughs> you, I don't know what the, the term is, but it's the how how thick your oh layer layer thickness. thickness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Oh, oh, microns. Yeah, th there's a U a tilde U ohms. Micro micrometer. Yeah, yeah. Um. So I went from 0.05 to point down to 0.03 is what I print at. And you could go down to 0.02 if you're like, ah, I want this mini on next Friday. Because it, <laughs> it, it greatly increases the print time, which yeah, makes total sense. It does. Right? How, yes. However many, however thick each layer is, if it's half as thick, well, it means you have to do twice as many. And then it takes the same amount of time per layer regardless. So anyway, so I went to 0.03. It could go down to 0.02. So when I went from 0.05 to 0.03, that's a 40% decrease. So that changes some things, right? Mm -hmm. And and the rest time and the, um, I can't remember what else. The exposure time, exposure time is really how much it changes a, a lot because there's less material there for you to cure. And yes. so- by reducing the layer height, you also reduce your exposure time, which then increases the quality uh, again. So, like theoretically, layer size should increase quality, but like it's do it doesn't happen very obviously. But because you can also underexpose air quotes as compared to like a uh, fifty micron uh, layer, um, you can get a higher quality for that reason as well. Yes, um, but yeah. by and large, <clears throat> that one worked using their. HD new HD resin right out of the box and this was my very first experience of having that like fuck yeah toaster oven bro yeah um <laughs> you gotta love the build plate though right yes yes you have to but they have the the really like get started startup instructions for all of these printers is universal they have you go through the same like five steps and those are all you know assuming they're tra their auto translator from Chinese to English worked right, which I'm not making a joke there because some of them are really bad yeah. to actually understand what they're asking you to do and where to go in the menus to find it and that kind of stuff. Um, as long as that's translated well, it's simple. Um, it, I didn't feel like I, I needed to Google anything or, or ask help for, for anyone to do that. And that has improved over time too. Those kind of like you felt like there was some kind of extra work and research I needed to do to just get the thing working 
because what was in your little in, in instruction packet didn't feel like it was everything I needed. Mm. Um, and so that was a thing. But that was the first time I had to deal with that, where it was like it actually, I had this aha moment of like, oh my gosh, the technology is, is here. And it feels like the generations of these things keep getting like better and better at a rate that's like really fast. It felt like like two years ago I had a 2K printer. Yeah. And that had, was the new thing. I had an anti-cubic photon S and it was like this, yes. is, this is the hotness right now. In, in two years it's, it's gone to 8K and new HD resins. And and this is kind of the catalyst for me talking about this um, this being our topic today. The technology, the hardware is 100% here I, in my opinion. If not, it is 90% here of what we need to be able to make our own models at home, print our own models at home, as high a quality as any model that is mass produced. What is what is stopping that from happening? It is 100% the artists that actually design the models for this use and being correctly supported. Yeah. Absolutely. This was fresh in my brain for what I did for for you all listening now was in my ro- most recent video. Um, I, I 3D printed and painted a model, and this is why I was, I was totally reminded. This model um, was beautifully designed. The artist that did it was, was White Werewolf Tavern. Um, he, uh, he had it both in 54 millimeter and 32 millimeter, and I printed them both out. And the 54 millimeter model, the way it was sculpted and printed out at that scale was, I would call 85% of the way there. The, some, uh, some of the details were just still a little bit too shallow. And this is my biggest issue with these is having to do with amount of details, but more than that, is the depth and crispness in how you design details on models. And when you do something bigger, like a dragon, okay, it could be a 32 millimeter dragon, but dragons are fucking big, or a 54 or 72 millimeter model, mm-hmm. um, the way you can get away with designing um, details, you have a lot more of a, of, of a give because you're simply printing something bigger. But when you get down to 32 millimeter, you have to be really purposeful you almost have to be an expert in understanding how to design in this scale to how that aesthetic works for a painter. Yes. For a painter. These are all made to be painted. Yes. And 90% of these companies that have Patreons or that they're on my manufactory are not designed to be painted. Hmm. I, I, I'm agreeing with the, your end statement, but... I mean, to a lesser extent, they're designed to be painted. Like, the majority of these designs are paintable. Like, would you call a CMON board game model designed to be painted? Like, Yeah, I think one interesting thing is, is what I... To clarify what I mean there. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you're dealing with plastic molds, when you're dealing with resin molds, when you're dealing with, like, the mass-produced board game plastic... They actually had something working in their favor, and that is the limitations of, of, especially historically, the limitations of amount of details, how crisp you can get in the details through the casting process, or the manually sculpting with green stuff or female or whatever process. That That is an interesting thing you, you bring up. Yeah, physically sculpting it gives you the ability to see it in hand at scale and not on a 28-inch monitor, so you can know okay, here's my sculpting tool, approximately the same size as a paintbrush. This detail is about the right size. Yes. Yeah. So the history of miniature sculpting is kind of given it the side, aired on the side of what you sculpt is not only able to be painted in a by most painters, but actually fun to paint. Mm-hmm. When, when you're dealing with the, the 3D design, which is not just 3D, these companies that make models to be 3D printed, but also by companies that 
make their own models now, like Games Workshop, like CMON, whatever. They're all using ZBrush. So why is it that the guys at Games Workshop and gals that are in their design team and the people that have their own 3D printing Patreons are using the same front end technology, but on the back end, one of them is, yes, they can over design in details. And you see that more in Games Workshop these days where it's like, you got more bags and bags and bags. Yeah, I think they've been dialing it back. And back. <clears throat> I, I think they're, they're, they're finding their way with the technology to yeah. find a balance, which is cool. Um, but it's not even about the amount of things to me. It's that the the care that's brought into each detail in understanding how thick this detail needs to be, how mm. pronounced it needs to be, how the corners, while they're of, of any detail, let's say it's a, a box, it's still going to have a sharp corner, but it's not a razor sharp corner. It's not just shink, it goes down to this this exact point if you zoom in a hundred times you'll see that is slightly rounded There's a little radius there. there's yeah. a little radius nothing is razor sharp in in things like cmon and things like gw and things like conquest all these models there's a level of attention brought to this you just in most things designed by 3d printing companies that are just to be able to put out it's not how it is it's like it's one millimeter thick with a razor edge sharp edge and it's following the contour of this lady's back or something you can't you can't paint that <laughs> no because when like say you wanted to, if you want to edge highlight a razor sharp thing the sharper the detail is the thinner the edge highlight is going to be you can't even see the edge highlight anymore. you can't even see it because it's just it's just so razor sharp and if you try to push your brush like if you're using the side of your brush and you push it onto the edge more, you're just going to get, it's not going to get any bigger because there is no surface to paint on. And if it is, you're wrapping onto the flats of both sides. Um, that, that's, that's, that's one of just so many things that GW does well. And it's because of just years of industry experience. Yeah. And right? I think there's probably a balance of like, it's come to be this way of like, they realize it and the, you know, you've got studio painters and stuff where it's evolved to be that way. Mm -hmm. But I also think probably at the beginning, um, I don't know how much of this is the case anymore. The limitations of your, your cast molds, like you can't get the pure razor sharp diamond edge on everything. And at least historically, maybe you couldn't. So you had to have a little bit of a, a, a groove to it. And so you probably, probably can now, right? right? I have laser, lasers that are like diamond sharp and they can just do whatever they want but diamond yeah. sharp lasers Dude, do you, do you guys even have the diamond lasers yet bro <laughs> if you are using diamond lasers i shoot my fucking laser through a diamond prism and when it exits it exits at this angle is incident to your fucking mom and then <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just, it's just a big fucking hopper and you got to melt the diamonds. <laughs> and the diamond juice is what powers the laser. Diamond juice, dude. You shoot it through like a syringe. Like a... Yeah, and shoot dude. the laser, shoots out diamond juice. Yeah, you melt that shit in Mount Doom and... <laughs> I don't know how many of y'all realize this was a science podcast. <laughs> yeah, fuck. We need to get about to get educated. <laughs> <laughs> Even diamond juice. Um, all right, so diamond juice. Otherwise, <laughs> one, one more time. <laughs> um, and I see this all the time. And here's here's where you got it. You get fucking spotty sense needs to tingle. Where you get that Metal Gear Solid. Do we, we have it? Do we have the technology? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dude, when you're looking at shit online and you're like, oh, this looks fucking awesome, it's always the 3D render. And it looks cool in that 3D render. You can, But you can suss it out sometimes. Yeah, but if they were to show you that same thing 3D printed, you your eye should keep up on like how many of these little tiny sharp little filigree things and every little bit of armor and they're not pushed out enough where it's like there's a nice differentiation between the plates or... All the, the the little tiny horns in whatever is like this triceratops head. Let's say it's a it's a like the size of like a a human skink kind of thing, but it's got like seven horns on its head and neck. That, from a design standpoint, that is not going to work. They're going to have to be all be tiny and super sharp, and so 
the the painting process is laborious. Each one of those, you, there's not enough volume for you to give anything more than just like, well, it's all skin tone or it's all white or it's all black. And each edge highlight you can't even see because they're razor sharp. It's everything is designed in a way as if it was a graphic design choice mm. and not as if it's an actual 3D model at the table painted. You're actually going to be able to discern what it is, but also just a, so unfun to paint. Yeah. That it's, yeah. How deep the recesses are, how much stuff pops out. You mentioned the curve of edges, those things, how much detail is on there. There are flat spaces. Uh, if the parts that are fun to paint are easy to reach, we're kind of getting into like model design, like as it's desired by miniature painters, which if I'm being honest are like the end customers to this product. So probably the, the opinion matters, but, but it's so much that we don't even realize you yes. know, about like how, what, what things we enjoy about a well sculpted model that you don't realize until you sculpt or paint a more amateur model. And you're like, Oh, why is this less fun or why is this more difficult to paint? It's kind of hard to put into words sometimes. Yeah. And I think as you paint, the more you paint and you find models that you really enjoyed painting or like you're really proud of how it turned out. And then you were to, to have one of these and you just like, Oh, I think early on in my painting journey, when I went through that, I, I, internalized all of that where it was on me where it's like ah, I'm just off my game today or ah, I just don't like how I did this or oh, I can't pull this off and some of that may be true mm. but the more you look at it over time over a, with a large enough sample size of painting different models from different manufacturers of, of all different types and sizes like you realize that the the sculptor that that artist and this is where the art of 3d printing really is still I won't say it's an infantile stage but it's still in its teenage development stage of what it could be where there's a lot of falling down and so my main kind of remark for today is that I'm super excited because the hard part we're 90 to 98 percent of the way there and that is the technology to physically print the things as cool as we'd like them to be that's there that's the hard part. That's something you and I can't will into existence. Mm. But the artistic side, I think, is still lagging behind. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's take a moment to step back here and say a lot. There's a lot of patrons out there that are single people that have been doing this for like some amount of years, maybe three, two years. And there's just like you should never be able to expect yourself to compete with a multi-million, billion-dollar company with 30 years of industry experience sculpting models for the express purpose of painting, yeah, which we're talking about GW. Yeah. Um, but I think what you guys can do is you can look at their products at, under a microscope in terms of like you know metaphorically under a microscope, and just look at all of these decisions they're making in terms of you know how how far out are the details spread, how much flat area is there for a painter to enjoy painting. You know, all these micro things really make a model more enjoyable to paint, 100%. And take that inspiration and, and put it into your own designs and your own aesthetic. I'm sick of seeing GW ripoffs. I want to see some new shit. Let's see it. But, you know, take those things they've learned from years of doing this and apply it to your own design. Yeah. Re restraint is a big part. It's like show yeah, restraint. Uh, yes. And show, like, you can have a very beautifully unique fun to paint armor style that isn't just the the part that makes it unique and lovely to paint and pleasing to look at is not its intricate complexity yeah yes and in a lot of ways that is so much more hard to do because to do something simplistic and like visually pleasing and like aesthetically unique and all that is hard. It's hard because also the other thing is that it's not real life scale. Right. So when you're zoomed into it and you're like, I'm going to make this shirt the thickness of a shirt. And it's like, no, 
that it, it's not going to be uh, it's not going to pop out enough from like the biceps of the arms or the wrists to be easy to paint where like that recess is, is deep enough. You need to make that thing thicker, um, but still looking realistic. So it's paintable, but it doesn't jump off the off the screen and be like that shirt is way too thick. That's super unrealistic. It's like there's this fucking golden middle line and you you only get there after trying it, printing it, saying that shit, and doing it over and over and over again until you figure it out, right? I bet at GW they have metrics for how deep a recess should be, whether it's like whatever, fucking 20 micrometers or whatever it is, and like how how tall a rivet should be. Um, mm -hmm. So they have a consistency across their entire range because yep. they've already figured that shit out. Yeah. They got written down in a document somewhere and they just follow it. Yes, where cloth meets skin. Yeah. How thick is that the cuff? Exactly. Where cloth meets skin it's on kinda, the neck. How all thick, that matters, how right? Thick. It matters incredibly. But when I mean, you, like, just at the wrist. Like, the rest of the body can taper off a little yes. bit and do whatever the fuck. Exactly. You know, but, like, that wrist area, that, yeah, that, that matters. The distinction of, of materials, mm. and this is something for every one time, and I think there's, there's only one time in memory I can think of this, and it was actually you dealt with it and not me. For that one time, I have more than that amount of times on most 3D printed models that I try to paint, and that is the question – is this skin? Is this a glove? Is this a shirt? Where where does the where does the leg start and the pants end? Mm -hmm. Like you had it the only time was on that ogre from Cursed City on, on a GW it, model, yeah. Yes, on, on his Michael Jackson glove. Yeah, and think like that is the norm for me anyway. When I'm painting something that's a 32 mil model that's 3D printed, is you have to over exaggerate due to scale. Yeah. And when you over exaggerate, you it it then narrows the amount of space you have to work with for the amount of details because each detail you do now has this like minimum millimeter layer height or thickness or depth or whatever. So now it kind of shrinks down what you can fit into that package. Mm -hmm. But people don't design that way. They design with this the most realistic thickness of my t-shirt compared to the size of my wrist, how thick that actually is, mm -hmm. is so small. And when you design that way in ZBrush, it looks beautiful on the screen. And it probably looks pretty darn good when you print that 72 millimeter model. Yes. But when you scale it down to 32, and this is where like all my frustration lies, is that it's, I'm talking about 32 here. And 54, there's still this is still somewhat of an issue, but 32. I want these to look good on the table. Let's take the painting thing completely out of the program. Let's say I zenithal, I slap chop, I throw a coat of contrast, whatever on it. It's not going to look as good when it's at arm's length, when everything is shrunken down to this little tiny, I can't, my, I can't differentiate it at the table. It doesn't look as cool that way. Yeah. And so I had an experience shrinking down all my wood elves from 75 to 32 and my sculptor told me that he had made changes to them, making that scale transition. But there were so much fixes to go. I think the Ranger went through three versions of me requesting a list of changes from my caster. They have sculptors on staff. And they fixed them. They 3D printed, cast it, sent it my way. And I was like, okay. And I went through three versions. The first change was like a list of 12 changes, a list of five changes, a list of three changes before we actually got to the point where it's like, okay, the head is the right level of too big uh, for realistic standards, but still paintable. All of these, there were like leaves under his like wrist gauntlets that when printed at that scale were fucking invisible. Like yeah. They're like little like, do I clean that out with my X-Acto knife? Yeah. You well, know, you like, don't know if it's an imperfection in the sculpt. Exactly. Or what it is. Red flag. Yes. Um, so it doesn't be there. All those things got fixed. I had, there were like stitches along patches. I'm like, I was like, just like, just drop the stitches. There were so many things where it was like, there were two straps crossing his a thigh. And I was like, remove one of the straps, make the one strap bigger and thicker mm -hmm. and pop it out more from his thigh. There was so much of that going on to make those models paintable at 32 mil. Um, and it, it's actually part of the reason why that whole casting process got slowed down, even for the 75 mil models. Cause I was just, we're spending so much time fixing those models. Cause it's a totally different beast. It's crazy. That scale. 32 I know. Mil. It's I crazy. Know. It is. It's a, 
it is its own art form. And mm. that's where I'm saying like that's my where my frustration lies. And now I'm I'm also gonna say this is not like universally no one knows how to do this. In fact, um totally separate but somehow still aligned in this in one of our news one of the parts of our news segment this week i'm going to talk about uh, a new kickstarter that i actually think got it right yeah. or at least they're re- they're on the path and i really hope that this works but what does it what's it going to before we get on to to supports cuz i want to talk a little bit about that too what's it going to take like, what do you think? Where, where, do, like, in an ideal world for you over the next three to five years in the three D printing landscape, what do you think is going to to change? Um, what would you like to see change that could make this a reality? Make the changes we want to see in the world. I mean, I think it takes people like us to sit down and think about what the differences actually are. Sure. Right. Because, like, it's one thing to say this model is less enjoyable to paint. It's an entirely another thing to say, this is why, um, and to really drill down and figure out all these things. Because I'm sure there's a ton of shit that we're not even talking about. Right. That is a, what separates a good painted, paintable model from a bad one. Um, so I would love companies to hear this this message we're, we're, we're saying and also hear it from other hobbyists as well, if they're saying as well. And just take some time to backpedal and really think about all the quality of life improvements they could make to a model that aren't aesthetic choices and to, and to incorporate them. Um, I, yeah, I think it just takes feedback from the community. Um, I, I mean, I totally believe we can get there hundred percent. Yeah. And per- we're purposely not like calling out names of, of companies big and small or whatever. I, I will, I mean, we're going to shout out somebody we think is doing well in the news. Um, but there are certainly companies that are doing it well, or are close, or they're really, really good at like the 54 mil size. I'm seeing a lot of those. Um, and so I feel like the guy who sculpted my void spirit model did a really good job of nailing 32 mil. Mm. Um, like that model legitimately was enjoyable to paint. Um, there were some changes we had to make. Like he, he was putting like wrinkles all over the dude's face. And I was like, that face is going to be tiny. I'm not gonna be able to see those wrinkles, just remove them entirely. And he did. And the face was like, this is golden. Because it look, it still looks like old man void spirit face without having to over over design that exactly. And that's the other thing too is like you you have to look at it from the eyes of a painter of like if a painter wants to add more of that micro detail, this the 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 hatching on a linen tunic yeah. or the 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 different textures of a patches on the pants you were talking about, give, give them the painter the the canvas to do it Mm -hmm. don't make them do it the way you want it done yeah you know you see that often especially at a larger scale stuff you see them like so much texture over different kinds of cloth like little hatching texture yeah yeah, yeah. on 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 shirts and whatever it's like great now i have to paint it that way yeah and also the detail is so fucking tiny, it's impossible to paint in a nice way. No, yeah, it is, it's like, well, I guess I have to kind of overbrush this tunic to show those one-eighth of a millimeter thick yeah. hatches on th- the texture on this tunic. I'm like, <sighs> litmus test for you. If your detail is so shallow and invisible that you can't apply a satin paint and then a wash to it and it doesn't look like ass, it's too it's too small, it's too fine. Yeah, like I, that's a great little litmus test. Um, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, there's like gotta be a minimum size for details that is like reasonably paintable, right? Like, to me, what I would like, what I would like to see, there's there's probably not a lot of these people in the world that are like have designed for other games that weren't for three D printing. Like the GWs, like the the Simons, like the Reaper, like there's a lot of them out there um, that had not de- that have designed for understanding the industry and the level of of technology that they've had to produce their own miniatures to take that experience and have them design a thing for three D printing and to see how that history that knowledge of, of years of experience of doing it in a different way would translate to this um 
instead of people that are like really good artists and are actually just making really good models, but it's not really designed for our gaming and painting needs. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a big, there's a, there's a gap there. And that's where I'd love to see like, does that going to take somebody that's has industry experience hopping into this field and doing it? Maybe that's what it maybe. And then them having a bunch of like of success that that will like cause the, the stream to change directions a bit. And other people will be like, oh, gosh, we have to keep up, you know, with that. Or is it going to be like someone actually pays attention to this podcast? <laughs> Honestly, I would love to see less quantity and more quality. I yeah. I feel so sad for all these Patreons that make 20 whatever 10 to 30 models a month and then when that month ends where the fuck do they go yeah they worry got work on the next month somewhere in the deep vaults of my mini factory oh, never God. to be found again so this is like there's such a ephemeral nature to these these things and so much time and love is going into them and they're just getting no visibility so i feel like if people just slowed down and made higher quality and less they'd get more visibility that be purchased more, appreciated more, because um, there's so much art. There's so much art hours going into these things, and they're just not being loved enough. And I think that's probably. I mean, we're we're. I'm kind of casting a, a wide net here. There's two. It, there's two issues with that come from that. One, I think the general public, you, of potential backers of Patreon backers, you are rewarded for quantity, like. If you're a company that pops out 30 a month, you see the direct increase in the size of your Patreon, how much money you make, and you are you're like you're a dog chasing your own tail. It's that Reaper Bones mythology, yes. right? It's like it's high volume D and D. Got monsters for everything now. Yeah, and and it's not even. And here's the the fucked up part about it. And this is exactly the same thing as Reaper Bones or whatever other mass minis example you know kickstarters for games is like 500 minis 0.5 percent of the population paint 50 percent of those in their lifetime so it's not even that people want it because they use it and they're taking advantage by painting them all it's about i could i have them all it's this this like glutton mentality of more is better mm -hmm. and so these companies are rewarded for this there, they are. There's a direct connection, and that's fine. But I think both can exist, right? I, I, I agree. I have, a, I have a second point to this too: of this dog chasing its own tail. When you are then stuck to committed to this rat race, gets bigger and bigger of how many you need to produce. The quality suffers greatly. Yes, you're having these issues with the islands you were talking about. Oh my god, issues with fucking slap supports on them. Get them out the door. They're supported shitty, and it's like there's twice as many supports as there needs to be. The and supports are bisecting details. Yes. So when you break them off, you lose the edge of your detail. Yes. It, there's you, you are really having issues with getting the final product to be solid even um, because of the, the shortcuts you're having to make to deal with quantity. Um, I think where that, that, wave is starting to subside a little bit because more and more companies entered the fray because they saw success that could be had and i think that we're coming back down over like more and more of the community is like oh great i've been supporting this couple of patreons for two years and i've got enough files backed up on my computer to print off 1500 minis how many of those minis have i one have i even printed two have i ever painted and then you get most of us come to this realization moment where it's like, oh, my God, what am I doing? Yeah. I want to have a thing that comes out with one to five minis a month. And I'm like, I can't fucking wait to hit print on my printer. Yeah. I want that thing. Yeah. I need that guy for my thing. Yeah. Yes. I want to paint it because it's fucking amazing. I can see it fitting into being a part of my army, being the next D&D &D character, being an awesome uh, boss monster for a game, whatever, like. I think we're going to find a balance and I think it's part of this evolution that that's there. And I think it's, it is leaning back that and I, I, we're never going to be gone from the, the people that make the masses. Yeah. Um, also there probably are Patreons and other sculptors who make paintable 3d prints. Like John and I don't have like, and like 
an insane breadth of knowledge about all of these ones that exist because there are so many. Yeah, it's so hard. Um, but the ones that definitely rise to the surface, you know, they they have issues um, that can be fixed super easily with a little bit of uh, TLC. Yeah, and I think about uh, another part of that too is um, when you're dealing with this. I, I had I totally had spaced about that, but one of our our longtime sponsors, Broken Anvil Miniatures, they have stuff that are 3D printing that are the 32 mil scale. And they like they have the level of detail stuff down. Yeah. Like their stuff is right. Now, it is stylized. Mm -hmm. So if you like that slightly fun World of Warcraft exaggerated um details, but not over designed, over detailed, you're gonna like their stuff. Yeah. If that aesthetic doesn't appeal to you, then it's like, well, then I'll look elsewhere. But the problem is there's not a whole lot of elsewheres right now that make the 32 millimeter stuff that they, they kind of have the balance, right, of details and, and size of details and crispness and all that. Yeah, and it's, um, it's not surprising that you mentioned that, that they're a company that molds and casts physical models. Yes. Right? So it's like, okay, they've probably taken a lot of that knowledge they've had from that experience and painting their own models, painting their own box arts. That's another thing. Yeah. A lot of these Patreons don't paint box arts because no. it's so high volume. They don't have any painters on staff, et cetera. So they don't they don't get that direct feedback from their on staff painters. Where it's like this was not enjoyable. Yes. So they do though at Broken Anvil and they do at GW and they do elsewhere at Reaper, right. possibly well, maybe not even Reaper. Um and that helps so much with that feedback and that improved quality of life paint job. Well, this is uh, other thing. This is not they're they're not sponsoring this episode. Broken Anvil isn't, but um their sculptor, like their their like their head sculptor or whatever, yeah, worked at uh, P3. P3. Yeah, yeah. He worked at Privateer Press for years, mm -hmm. and their stuff was all physical models, metal models. Mm -hmm. So he take that years of experience. That's kind of what I'm, I, I mentioned earlier. Yeah, is you have somebody that understands that, mm -hmm. and he's an active painter too. Like you can see where that knowledge of how detail works, how sculpting works at that scale, to be readable, to be distinct. Um, the, all that kind of level of detail stuff um, has has translated into the work that they do, and that's probably that's more the exception than the rule right now. Yeah, that definitely. But you can see how it impacts the end product, like playing its day. Yeah, um, which is that's pretty cool. All right, let's talk about just real quickly supports, and then we can put a bow on this. Yeah. Um, so one thing I learned about supports and regarding orientation while using Lychee is depending on how you orient the model, you obviously have more or less supports. So there is kind of a golden angle for where it's like the thing I care about the most is facing upward, but I also have 20 extra islands that I wouldn't have had otherwise if I rotated this thing five degrees on the Z-axis or something like that. Um, and so I, when I was having to redo my fucking supports my vampires, curse you last sword, um, <laughs> I was playing around. I was rotating, changing things, hitting fine islands like every single time. And like it was cr incredible how the smallest change reduced it by a factor of 25%, by 30%, by 40%, by just rotating it a tiny bit on one axis. Have you ever played around with that? No. Because you, yeah, cause you haven't gotten to the manual support game? No. I, dude, that's, fuck it. It's a terrible game. That's a game I don't want to play. That's a game for a young man, dude. It's a, yeah, it's a young man's game. <laughs> I don't want... I, 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 I get it. I installed Leechy uh, recently, too. Oh, God. When I first did it, I was like, what the fuck is going on in this app? I'm just terrified. Yeah. Um, but I... Uh, I yeah yeah I don't want to have to. I like... That's a thing. Is like... Yeah. You shouldn't, honestly. You shouldn't have to. If I'm paying money for a product a digital product in this situation it should be i don't want to say it has to be a hundred percent optimized for the best possible way this thing can be printed but it needs to be it needs to be good like there's so many of them that they're just like real thick lazy supports on stuff and like the connection points for the size of the model in reference to that to the how big the connection points are and how many there are and all that and i'm just like Oh, this is a it's crazy how big a variation you can get for someone that elegantly expertly supports a model at a 32 mil size specifically compared to those that aren't 
it is it can make and break yes how good the model is it doesn't matter how well you designed it yes. you fucked up those supports it ain't it ain't happening it ain't happening no one's getting a model if it ain't gonna print right right yeah that's so that's so stupid now you say that out loud but it's so true um yeah it's and this is that it is i think supports are this fun middle ground of art and science yeah because it requires both so you it is a certain skill set um, and level of experience to really do that. And I think as time goes on, there's going to be more and more people that have developed that skill set to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't ever think, I mean, I, I hope I'm wrong. I am hope that auto click the auto support button is one day like it gets you 85% of the way there and like it's good enough most of the time. But we're dealing with such a small, delicate scale of things. That I don't know if that day would ever come. Um, but like, in my eyes, um, there's going to be a level of cleanup and model prep for any model we do. So we're talking at a 32 mil scale. You're cutting something off a sprue. Or you get the CMOM plastic and you still got that mold line around the thing. It's already pre-built. Or it's a 3D printed and you've got the supports to deal with. There's a level of prep there. I am okay with the level of prep being the amount of hours taken for a 3d print to be a little bit more because I get so much benefit from this. You almost feel like you're cheating, right? <laughs> like I 3d print this out. It's cost me 80 <laughs> cents in resin. You know, yes, I had to support this Patreon and they send me stuff monthly or I bought it in my mini factory or this, that, or the other, but price compared to buying a physical box of models, where, 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 where do I have to like make up for that, that great value I have here? And that means I'm okay with spending a little bit more time in the prep side. But if done correctly, I could argue that the time it takes to prep and assemble and clean a model off a sprue by Conquest or Games Workshop or whomever would take about the same amount of time. And sometimes that could even take more time than... Printing a model, dealing with the the cleaning, the the curing, the clipping off, and dealing with those those divots. Yeah, my problem is with the issues you experience with three D printing is you often don't discover them until you are painting. Yes, They're so small and hard to find. Yes, right? See those little those little connection points. Yeah, a little like, bit of support left over, or a little like a little scoop from where there was some kind of thing. Yeah, it's they're tricky. Yeah, they're tricky, and at that small scale, especially. I just did that for my last video. There's like two or three of them on there. And as I put a brush over like this blue paint over, I'm like, fuck. (laughs) There's a little one right there. I fucking missed it. Yeah. I missed it. I got 75% of them, but that still means I missed 15. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And like, I think uh, people have started to figure out like, what's the minimum or the maximum, I should say, with support I can use such that it doesn't create damage. Right. And those are the kinds of supports um, that you want to use on parts of the model that are going to be painted. And then on parts like the bottom of the foot or the inside socket of where the arm is. Yeah. Put those thick ass honkers on, those big anchors, right? Yeah. Because damage doesn't matter, but it holds it down to the build plate yeah. and allows the other smaller supports to do their job, making sure no islands exist. So it's like, this is, there's definitely a process, um, and there are people who are good at it, people who are not good at it. Yeah, that, <laughs> there is a lot more of that art in, in, in making those decision making things, and it's so wild how how in the grand scheme of things, the size difference between a 32 millimeter human and a 54 millimeter human is not that grand scheme of things. They're not that much different in size mm. when it comes to supports. Jesus fucking Christ. It might as well be the difference between the Statue of Liberty and an ant. <laughs> it's so great, that difference. It's wild. And I, it's like you're just dealing with just a, such a small size that it's like you really got to get it right, right, mm. because you don't have so much room for, for give. On a larger model, it's just like, oh, well, yeah, there's I can totally see and sand it smooth or whatever and yeah. it, you can have a couple more big ones and it's not a big deal and all these little tiny ones are just like they disappear. Mm-hmm. But when it's tiny like that, oh fuck. It's 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 there. There I just think to me the the support thing is I look what I kind of go back to is I look at the um the Kingdom Death 
models that you can buy that they 3D print. So that they've done this for years. And the orange ones? Yes. They're, they're a good example. The orange ones that are they're photo resin ones. Yeah, like the death high models. Yes. Yeah. Um the quality of their printer to this day, the, the printer that they use for those, it's not as good as my 8K printer right now. No. My 8K printer prints better than their shit. But it's still very good. But I can see their layer lines way better, way more distinctly than I can. Um than like that that chick necromancer that I showed you, like her smooth, clean skin. Because there's a lot of fucking skin on Kingdom Death stuff. Mm-hmm. You got big old thick thighs and big old breastuses. <laughs> big eyes, like, big eyes. Yeah, they got a lot of smooth parts on they, they have a lot more layer lines in there than that thing that I printed. Mm-hmm. But what they have still ahead of them in their photo resin is super fucking tiny, itty bitty little supports. Like there's not those divots on their models. No. They're just like, oh, sometimes you get one in the mail and it's got a couple little support things still attached. Like you like barely touch. It's like, dink. It's like, Funk. it comes off clean. That's where they have something in their fucking alien technology. <laughs> I don't know if that's just dialed in exactly or they're all pre-supporting everything themselves and they know how to do it. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, higher exposure time is going to make those little tiny supports uh, be more rigid and stick around. Um, but I, I don't know what it is. Maybe some, some sauce, some secret sauce. Yeah, but that's what they have. So put a little bow on this. We are we are just trying to, if, you, if you've done any 3D printing, Take it to the Facebook group. Take it to the the comment section here on YouTube. Let us know what you were like, what you think the state of the union right now of three D printing. Are you are you excited of where it's going? You think it's just fine where it is? Maybe you're like, listen, all these big ass Patreons that pop out fifty models a month, they're doing great. I love to print those and paint those. I I'm curious if people think that. Yeah. Um, also, leave your Canes hate at the door. Okay. <laughs> I don't fucking appreciate that on the Facebook. Only Canes lovers and enthusiasts. <laughs> we want you to have whatever opinion you have. No, we don't. Other than when it comes to fried chicken <laughs> and hard cookies, baby. I don't want to fucking hear about Zaxby's shit. I don't, I've never had Zaxby's. Maybe I want to hear about confusing. Hardee's, Tendies. Oh, you know, there's a Hardee's in, in a nearby town, but I've never had their tend, tenderific Tendies. I don't want to hear about it. No one, don't tell me about your chicken. <laughs> I like my chicken. Chicken. I right. roasted chicken again the other day. You're a broaster. Fuck broasting chicken. Really? Oh, no. broasted chicken is like, hey, you want fried chicken, but you want someone that's too lazy to come up with a sweet ass crispy skin recipe for the batter. Nah, we ain't gonna spend no time with that. Hey, and because of that, most of the moisture from the white meat is fucking gone. <laughs> That's roasted chicken. So is that boiling and roasting? Broasting chicken is basically fried chicken, but it's not <laughs> like it doesn't have a it doesn't really have they don't put like a deep fried? I think it's deep fried. Okay. I'm pretty sure they don't have any kind of a batter on it. Yeah. And whatever they do is it's, it's not as good. No. It's not as good. Chicken is tricky. It's already fried. Fuck, it's not going to be good for you. Why you call it broasted? Like, it's some old-timey phrase. Like Anyway, I had it another is. one. I was like, there's no good fried chicken in my town, so I just have to try all the broasted chicken, and I was like, solid 7 out of 10. Anyway, that's what we're talking about, broasted chicken. Anyways, yeah, we want to know what you what you think. I I I think we are we are on the precipice of greatness of 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 what the future of 3D printing models is. We are so close and yet still so far away. That is true. And so that's the the, the catalyst again for me, the excitement of I think the technology is there. I don't think we're held back now. And being like, oh, but you can't get the detail. It's kind of mushy details in the face like you can with with GW models and stuff. And I was like, I just printed a 32 millimeter little lady's face that is as clean as GW's faces. The technology is there. Eyes opened. Yeah, eyes open, upper lid, lower lid, but not so fucking tiny. You you use like, that doesn't even matter. Yeah. Right. She got nostrils on the sides. You know, you can you can contour that with paint to make to accentuate the the female features. Mm-hmm. Cheekbone structure was there, all on thirty two millimeter scale, where the where the hair met was correct. The nice crispness, 
not just little flat little like fiddly fiddly lines like <laughs> it's the technology is there you mark you're gonna have to make our hands a little bit bigger all right we're gonna have to have a little bit of man hands going on let's have a, let's have a talk here we need to talk about hands and feet because those things and they're so fucking tiny it might as well not even try, <laughs> especially when you put the supports on there. Good gravy. Yeah. Shall we? We shall. Out of the news. News. Starting off with a sad uh, one, Ed Pugh, the founder and CEO of Reaper Miniatures, has passed away this uh, last Thanksgiving. Um, we have some uh, some little factoids here from our writer about Reaper that you want to share with you. Sure. First one. In 1992, Ed and his brother David founded Reaper Miniatures, starting with two lines. The first one was called Distinguished Flying Collectibles. What a name. Yes, which was World War II aircrafts. And the second line was Renaissance Dreams, a.k.a. Fantasy with Jewelry. It wasn't until 1996 that Reaper launched Dark Haven, its first 25 millimeter fantasy line for tabletop RPGs. And I got something to share about this because I have a night. I, I shared it at one point in my like my pile of shame video, but I have a 1994 Reaper, um, like a little diorama with Smog and all the dwarves and the Hobbit in in there. And wow! It, and it has all the crystals. And we said this this fantasy ones with like crystals. That's what they did originally with their fantasy ones. They all had crystals on them. Yeah. Um, and they weren't necessarily designed to be painted. At least I didn't think so. Like, but they had some level of in the pewter. I don't know if they put some kind of a, a wash or something where there's you could see the some distinction in the volumes of the sculpting. Mm. Um, in there, so it was meant to be that way. So I have a even sign. I I should look into it, see if it has the signature of the sculptor who it was sculpted by. But this is 1994 on there. I remember getting that as a kid. I got this confirmation, confirmation from church. You know, you went to, did you do confirmation? Absolutely. That was my con- confirmation gift from my parents. Mine was mine was a sword. Fuck yeah, bro! Fantasy shit. <laughs> Fuck God. <No. laughs> whoa! Hey, whoa! Too far. Whoa! Uh, too far. Yeah, I. Do you remember your confirmation verse, bro? Now we're getting down. There. No, I do not. All right, we don't. Need, uh, we don't I need think to it was Corinthians nine fourteen. Okay, mine was Ephesians six eleven, which is in reference to the armor of God, which is why I got uh, the sword. Mine was, um, and then God had created orangutans <laughs> and fruit bats <laughs> and breakfast cereals. <laughs> That was mine. That was mine. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. yeah. Um, Reaper is asking to honor their memory of the passing CEO to donate to your local animal shelters. That's always really great when you take uh, an unfortunate situation like this and turn it into good uh, for something that they're passionate about, which I I know you are definitely for um, giving some love to animal shelters. So yes. we're sorry uh, to the Reaper staff and everyone uh, in, in Ed's family that was affected by his passing. Um, we wish you well, and we hope that uh, people people donate to animal shelters a lot. Yes, and I'm sure there'll be a, a wonderful memorial to Ed at uh, the next Reaper Con, and mm. um, and, and uh, there's already some some wonderful kind of memorials out there online for him, and it's um, truly one of like the founders of of the hobby as we know it. Like, you seem to be from all accounts, and it's been great on the, on a lot of Facebook. Um, pages people are having sharing memories of times of talking with Ed. You know, he would just talk to anybody at Reaper and at ReaperCon and just about sharing for his passion for for the hobby and just a very um, humble man. So awesome. All right. Speaking of that case story that you were uh, foreshadowing, I foreshad I foreskin shadowed this. Okay. <laughs> Keep your fucking dick out of here. All right? <laughs> It's called Trouser Turnips 28. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. See what I did there? Yes. Yeah, trouser. No. Turnip 28 is a, uh, it's called the Forlorn Hope, which is a gr- fucking great name. Yeah, Forlorn Hope. Like um, it's a Kickstarter now live, and it is a post-apocalyptic vegetable war game. Now, I'm before, thinking Veggie Tales right now. Yeah, you, you're not, this is not your, your grandma's veggie tales here <laughs> um so it's it's a it's a very like unique design aesthetic of like medieval like gothic almost uh, war game 
that is like has this weird macabre twist to it. Yeah, I don't fully get it. No, I don't either. I want to look into it and like be like, what the fuck is Tramp Twenty Eight? Like, I don't like, it's, understand. It's, it's this weird. Like the root vegetables are slightly disturbing. They're present. <laughs> I don't know if it, if they're for sustenance. I don't know if they're sentient. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but um, this this art style and this direction has been around for a while, and it's being turned into um, an official game and official models. And when I said there are some companies that the level of detail and how they design things are being done correctly, if you look at the models for this and they're all these are ones that you've even seen printed and whatever and shown out there those are all 3d printed and the level of detail is right on par baby yeah there's a a painter that i actually used in a uh, for like one of our favorite painter uh sections in the extended portion of the podcast that you get access to as a patron um who painted a a female necromancer uh do you remember that model he has painted several of these 3d prints and they look they look mint. Uh, they look so clean and so nice. Scott, why don't you scroll down to uh, what I put for our favorite mini for the after party? Is it Mike Mutiny? You bitch. It's Mike <laughs> Mutiny. <laughs> no, is it the turnip guy? Yes, fucking yes it is. <laughs> oh, look at that. I saw his paint job, before, and that was like my catalyst for figuring out about this Kickstarter, was seeing his paint job on Instagram. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. That's uh, the right level of detail, the right size of details. God damn. Yeah. So um, we'll put a link down to the Kickstarter. Um, I haven't yet, but I am 95% certain I am going to back this project if for no other reason than to print these off, some of these models off, which I guess they're all modular, like different heads. Yeah, they're designed to be kitbashed. Yeah, different backpacks, different arms and whatever. And they're unlocking more and more of these because for like $30 US, you get all the stuff for all the STLs and stuff. And then you get the rules for the game, too. Mm-hmm. Like, come on, man. I think people also play Sludge with these minis. I might, I might be incorrect there, but Sludge uh, is another game made by people who make Relic Blade. Yes. And by the people, I mean the one guy. Sean. Sean Sutter, yeah. <laughs> just Sean. Yeah, just Sean. It's him in his basement just fucking just slaying. <laughs> yes. Yes. It is a very similar aesthetic style, too, of, this, of Sludge. I really dig Sean's... The aesthetic he has for Sludge too. Yeah, oh, it's so cool, and dude, it's a great fucking game name, bud. Dude, when I go to Adapticon next year, and it keeps happening, it keeps increasing. I'm gonna play so many fucking games, dude. I'm gonna play so many demos. You got a game at Adapticon, and you watch, you see me walking by, be like Scott, can play my game. I'll be like, all right, let's do it. Let's do it, dude. I already told Malev one night this year at because uh, Malev is the. Uh, he's the the studio painter. He is the co brainchild. Uh, works very closely with Sean Sutter on, on Relic Blade. I told mm-hmm. him, I'm like this year one night, dude. We need to do some Long Islands and Relic Blade because <sighs> last year when we were uh, when I was running our D and D game, I was so bummed because that same night, uh, Malev was running Relic Blade up yeah. there in the open table. Yeah, I was hanging out with him, and he was fucking. He told me he's got pretty pretty drunk on Long Island he iced did, teas. Dude. He was expressing his love to me. It was yeah. insane. Yeah. And I was like, I, I told him, like, Malev, my greatest regret from Adepticon 2022 was that I did not get to in, experience Long Island Relic Blade with Malev. <laughs> yeah, like, dude. We need to rectify this. It was the Black Sight Studio guys. They were playing either right next to me, they were playing Sludge, or they were playing in that demo. Those are the guys that make uh, Don't Look Back. Mm. They were, we, were all, we were all hanging out. It was good. It was a good time for sure. Don't look back. Don't look back. Check it out. The Kickstarter. We'll have all these we have all the news items linked in the description if you want to check them out. Next up, Warcry Roster Builder. Build your rosters. Rosters. Uh the roster builder, the War Scroll Builder for AOS, it's pretty good. I, I enjoy using it. The the only reason only time it can get better is if the stats for the actual units were in the thing. I could like click on a thing and like go to see some stats. That'd be great. Uh, but this one, you keep talking. I got to pee, so you go. You work around this, and then we're gonna come back. And I'll take the quiz, okay? All right. Oh, maybe you can, you can premise. You can premise it too. I will. I'll, I'll just stop right back. All right, John's peeing. Okay, so I actually didn't know this, but our our writer figured out that this app was previously branded as Veranscribe, and GW kind of acquired it and 
added it to their suite of online apps for list building. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that GW worked with other like software engineers, programmers in that way. Um, I don't play Warcry, so I don't know like how good of an app it is, but it's there for you to use. Now, next up on the list here, we got the Warhammer quiz to find your perfect gift. They created this marketing stunt online for you to take that essentially guides you to like get a gift for someone that you know i think its intent is for someone that is not into the hobby to buy a gift for someone that is into the hobby and so it's like your mom or something like that or, or whatever and so like there's a there's a list of questions that is being asked about a third person it's like are they into tanks or dragons are they into like uh, big miles or small miles? Do they, do they play the game? Like all these questions it asks. And so I and James took the quiz and James's result was get them more 40K models. <laughs> Just like generically, I guess. I don't know. When I took the quiz, it said uh, uh, this person wants a big fancy H Sigmar model. And it listed a couple examples um, listed Gobsprack, Catacros, and Sigvald. And um, I am not interested in paying any of those models. <laughs> but like, what do you expect from like a seven question, you know, questionnaire? Um, Sigvald, maybe. Maybe. But the other two, I'm not super into like monster type creatures. So that, that doesn't really work for me. But uh, furthermore, I, I think if someone got the same result as me, um, that. Uh, they would get the same list of models. I think it was just a generic uh, return, which is what we're going to do right now with John. John's going to take this Warhammer quiz live uh, and see what results he gets. And we're going to, we're going to tell you the, the questions he's asked and the options that he can pick from. And just, just like that, as if it was planned, he is back. All right. I'm ready to take this Warhammer quiz and see what I'm, I'm going to buy. Do I have to buy it? Like, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah. It's required actually. Okay. But you have to buy it from the source. Oh, okay. How about it? All right. Let's see. What's what's the first start, question okay. here? Okay. Start quiz. Are am I new to Warhammer? No. Very no. No bitch. What do they think are cooler? Dragons or tanks? Fucking dragons, bro. I mean, tanks are cool and all, but I would rather have a dragon than a tank. Like, oh, hey, man. Oh, well, I'm going to get you a Christmas gift. Do you want a dragon you can ride to work? On Monday, or would you rather ride in a tank? I'm like, fucking dragon. Yes, that's always the question. Yeah, what yeah. would you rather ride to work on? What do they? Th what is? What do they find most fun? A. Reading books. B. Playing games. Or C. Painting models. Which one? Which one am I, Scott? I pick painting models. I mean, yeah. I'm not look. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not at. I'm not at Warhammer.com to buy books, motherfucker. <laughs> Um, I'll go to places that make good literature if that's what I want to do. <laughs> so I will choose painting models. That's why I'm here. I'm here for sweet ass models. Right. I, I enjoy playing games, but like most of the goody peepees and literally everybody that uh, buys Warhammer models, um, I don't paint. I don't play as much as I would maybe like to, or in an ideal world in time. So, but I always have time to paint, baby. Let's paint models. Okay. What? Did they screw this up? I don't know. So the next question. Do I prefer longer novels or lots of short stories? Uh-oh. Did they fuck it up? Oh, no. I had I did that question, too. Okay, okay. Even after saying the same thing that you oh, did. Oh, yeah. I, I prefer novels. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. Do I prefer quick games or longer games? I'm so curious if you're going to have the exact same answers as I do. Oh, man. There's only nine questions here. We've not gotten to narrow down anything other than dragons or tanks. Um, Quick games. Honestly, I don't like playing a game for like four hours. Like it just feels like such a drain. And like I feel like my like my fun is so at the mercy of how that four hour game went. Okay. But that said, I like the epicness of of games with miniatures too. Okay. So what's your answer? Fuck uh, D, none of the above. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna say little combi. Little combi. All right, am I trying to gain the system here? Are they going to let me? Are they going to let me buy Warhammer Underworld stuff by pick short games? <laughs> Maybe actually, Long, yeah. Longer games, baby. Give me that Archeon. Okay, longer games, longer games. Do they need to paint? Do they need new paints and tools to make their models? 
If you fucking make me buy that goddamn squiggle stick to prime my models on. Oh, no. No, I, I don't. Anyone I cer- doesn't need tools and materials. It's this man right here. I want to. I was wondering the other day if I own the most unique miniature paints of anyone in the world. I don't think so, but maybe you're in like the top like 1%. I mean, I have almost every paint of almost every line. That's not healthy. First of all, don't do that. <laughs> Second of all, I I I don't even want to know. Okay, no I <laughs> no I don't need new paints and new models. Have I painted any GW models before? Yes, I have. Is that the last question? No, I'm on 8 of 9 now. Do they want a whole new army or are they adding to an existing one? I would say technically I haven't started Slaves to Darkness and if it's a if it's an army I already have I pretty much have what I want for it, right? Like, if I wanted it, I already bought it. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna say new because I don't consider myself owning a Slaves to Darkness army yet. Also, if I did a 40k army, it would probably be a new one. Um, this is this is the first time that you and I have deviated. Okay, that question. I want new army, baby. New army. Do I play games at home? This is the last goddamn question. They are not narrowing this down at all. No. Do I play games at home? I do play games at home. Yes. My daughter and I play Cur City. I taught my daughter how to play magic cards. Nice. It was her choice, not mine. <laughs> but she's beat me two out of three games. Okay. Oh, God. Uh, whooped her ass last night. <laughs> kid. <laughs> I can't say kid fun. <laughs> it looks like they're... Looks like I am a Warhammer Age of Sigmar fan looking for a great model to paint. And the models are? Okay. Gobsprack, Catacross, Catacross, Sigvald. Sigvald. (laughs) Okay, I knew it. They don't Uh, narrow down, like, anyone who ends up with painting a model, they're going to say these same shits. Yeah, this is a sham. I already own Catacross. Um, it's not a sham. It's it, whatever. It's fun, but it's not at all comprehensive. Gobsprack is a sweet model, but I have no interest in swamp bogglers. <laughs> Fucking swamp bogglers. And Sigvald, much to Vince's chagrin, is not my not my jam. I'm uh, with all the three that of those three. I'm the most interested in Sigvald, but not enough to buy and paint him. Oh, for sure. I I mean, and totally. And you're probably in the same boat as me. Sigvald makes a a, a sexy mannequin to st- for a starting point for a, a vampire lord. Oh my, yeah, absolutely, version. he does. Shout out, shout out, Pete Harrison. Yeah, Petey Pete, the the war gamer. Yeah, he he did that conversion. Yeah, his uh, Petey Pete, the war gamer, has a great YouTube channel. Just uh, type into uh, YouTube Petey Pete, the war gamer. Yeah, I think that'll get you there. It'll get you somewhere. <laughs> All right, next news item. Pretty cool, actually. Uh, Catacap, a private equity firm, has acquired 60% of the shares of Arm Painter, which means they technically own Arm Painter, right? Is that how that works? When you have yes. majority shares... Yes, only needed own. was 51%. Yeah, exactly, yeah, you own it. Um, founder and CEO Bo Pensoft is staying in place as the CEO and as a significant shareholder, which will free him up from things like distribution and return him to R&D. Okay. Not a sale as much as an acquisition, and Catacap can bring capital required to bring Army Painter to the next level. That's, I mean, I'm reading this. That's not my personal opinion. Um, Okay, so there's notes from uh, James the Writer Goblin here that says, um, there is a point where a manufacturing company requires a serious capital injection to get to a new tier, and this seems like the play here. Yeah. Um, interesting, interesting, interesting. They got big big ideas, and they need to fund them. Big plans. This is, this is the company's version of Kickstarter, selling their fucking company. No, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, you, you need it. Yeah, you need, this is the way where you can get capital to reinvest into the company and you, you just have to hope that your your new majority investor stakeholder um their vision is in line with yours yeah it doesn't they don't guide you into the fucking lake yeah i mean because your day one vision you you know you're all you're all on the same page you know you're all like yeah we're we're, we're all gonna order a, a canadian bacon and green olive pizza. We all love those two things. We're ordering the pizza. You're sitting down. You're eating the pizza, right? Yes. Day one, you're all eating the same pizza. You're worried about as over time, 
things may 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 change. Someday you wake up and you're like, I prefer anchovies as my saltiness on my pizza to green olives. And uh, I'm like, I don't like this. So that's that's just business. I'm not this is not anything specific about an army painter in this shit. I don't fucking know. Yeah, I guess seeing this like you could be a little bit worried for army painter's sake, but you you can't really be worried at this stage. You have to kind of wait and see what happens. The optimist would say the hobby is growing and supported supported in such a way where this environment is a reality yeah. that that a company doesn't buy up 60% of the shares because it's a bad investment in their eyes, yeah. right? So, you know, it, it's showing that, that there's a potential in the hobby as a whole of what we look at it and that the growth is continuing. You see how many different fucking product lines these painting and hobby companies are coming out with these days. Like, mm-hmm. it's not because they're not making money off it. No. That's a good th- that's a good thing for us. More more options. Yeah. Um, Dungeon Bowl got its first expansion announced. Uh, it's called Death Match and has the College of Life and College of Death, which are just honestly just repackaging of other teams. The College of Life, for instance, is the Halflings and the Wood Elves put together. And College of Death is... Uh, some of the many uh, undead Blood Bowl teams put together into a box. Uh, so D- Dungeon Bowl isn't Blood Bowl for dummies, right? It's just like their underground version. It's kind of Blood Bowl for dummies, but the game is already a game for dummies. Um, in, <laughs> in that it is a casual experience full of randomness and joy. <laughs> dummies are dummies. I mean, so this is like... It's maybe. about having fun. It's not about overcomplicated... This rules, even rules more sets. so. Dungeon Bowl is even it leans into that even more. Mm. Uh, it's even e- even funner and, and more casual. We hear you like four D chess. Have you tried one D chess? <laughs> just the, the, there's it's one just fucking an, line. <laughs> it's just an open board where everything is one square. <laughs> no, we don't move. Yeah, you just on put one D chess. You put them in the box. And you kind of shake them around. A little. <laughs> you pull them out. You see how many are still standing. Yeah. How many fell over? You win That's the winner. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what else we got here? Uh, Warhammer Fest 2023 tickets. Um, I guess from what I heard, they went live and sold out immediately again. <laughs> but we're being told like this might be a whole Taylor Swift issue with ticket experience. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Thing that they they need to like r- allow them to be open again. That's probably by the time you all hear this is all squared away. But my poor wife had to deal with that Taylor Swift bullshit. Oh, no. The last time she came through, her and her friend went and saw them. And so she was like, oh, she's coming through again. I'm ready. She, like, signed up for the pre-order list and was on the list. Never got an email. Never got an opportunity. She, like, tried to, like, wait. The site timed out. Didn't get a ticket. Never went to an actual sale for normal human beings. Well, at least, I mean, that in the grand scheme of things, she could have been one of the, like, three million tickets that sold and had to deal with undoing all of that. Oh, they're not going to undo that. They're just going to, there's, they're selling, like, three million tickets for one show that there's, like, 50,000 seats for? Well, they have sold them. They're, peop, individuals bought them. But I think the issue was that they were all in pre-order. So, like, that ne- there was never an opportunity for, like, an, a person who, like, wasn't on some sort of list there was no general admission opportunity to buy the tickets. Yeah. They were all sold accidentally uh, to like uh, pre-order people, um, which is sad. Uh, lastly, just because he's so so into it, uh, our uh, our writer James here is hyped for a GI Joe miniature game called Mission Critical, a Gen Pop release of a previously funded Kickstarter campaign. And the first ever miniature board game purchased by the Ryder Goblin. There it is. It is wow. a G.I. Joe-themed miniature board game. Okay. Okay. G.I. Joe Mission Critical. It's $120 available now. It looks okay, but again, they're and 3D renders, so. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 hard to say on board game plastic stuff. But this game, it's this would be more like, are you into that the IP, right? Mm-hmm. Dude, fucking Cobra Commander coming at you. Mm. My question is, do they have Sergeant Slaughter? I don't Sergeant think I know Slaughter. that water. Sergeant Slaughter was the like one of the first crossovers of our of our uh, of our time. Sergeant Slaughter was a wrestler in uh WWF back at the time. Okay. But he was also a a G.I. Joe. 
Like he had his own action figure. He was on the cartoons. Nice. I mean, he's a real person. Like he was a real man. That was a real wrestler. Okay. So yeah. Anyway, now you got your history lessons for the day, guys. <laughs> Hundred twenty bucks. Yeah. Anyway, that's, anyway that yeah. is that is the newsy news. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for hanging out with us this long, long, likely three hour long episode. So many hours. So I know it's been long when my like my ten D shoot is so ready to be filled. You're on E right now. I'm on E. I have no energy left. I'm getting a little bit loopy. Yeah, a little loopy. After party got a little loopy, Johnny needs some yum-yums in his tum-tums. <laughs> exactly that. I could not have said it better myself. <laughs> I didn't get a mid-episode cakester to see me through. <laughs> I got them. You need any. Bro, we got leftover cakesters? Have, no one's eating them. <laughs> Why? Why? Why would somebody leave soft cookies around? Because they're shit. They're shit. Anyways, if you like the podcast and you want to support it, uh, you can go to your local grocery store, buy Oreo Cakesters, and while you're checking out, after you buy them, pour them out on the floor and stomp them into the ground as an act of defiance. Yes. After you buy them, don't be a dick. Yeah, don't be don't don't do that to stuff you haven't purchased. And then while you're stomping on them, sign up for our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh on our Patreon, we have extended episodes of the podcast where we talk about things like our favorite models from other painters. We got a little preview of John's favorite one this this uh, this week. Ooh. We also get um, access to patrons giving us their models so we can give them feedback live during an episode. But they can also give us topic suggestions. Last week came from one of our patrons. Mm -hmm. And also we talk about things that we tried for the first time. Today I talked about uh, my Vallejo Express color experience. John talked about his experience trying to mimic a GW paint plan that kind of had some spotty holes in it. Mm. Uh, so we tried a lot of new things. Talk about the experience with that. It's about 30 minutes longer. You can check that out. If you're not into that, you can also pick up one of our uh, many merch items on Teespring. That's also linked down in the description below. Supporting our sponsors helps uh, them send a message that, you know, it's worthwhile giving them our dollars. We uh, kind of pick them because we like them. And also, if you don't have any money to spare, that's totally fine. You can share our podcast with your nerd friends. You can subscribe on any one of the platforms that you listen to podcasts on. Comment below. Join the face, uh, Facebook group. All those things help a lot. Great. You can go, like, here's another thing that's free if you're like, oh, I don't have a lot of dollar to do this. You can go to, like, our sponsor's web website and be like, go to Gamers Grass, right? And you go to the email us. You know, and be like, mm. talk about, you know, just give us your feedback. You know, every website has those and be like, hey, man, you guys sell some sweet ass grass. I heard about it on Trapped Under Plastic. Thanks for supporting the guys. Later. <laughs> that'd be, if you did that, that'd be fucking sick. Yeah. I would, that'd be awesome. Right. That's it. And then you can also like in the, if they have like a suggestion box, you'd be like, you need to make a grass that's called Pineapple Express. <laughs> <laughs> because... Somebody will get that. Yes. And I will appreciate the shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's wrap her up. You guys, it's been great. You know, we're closing in on the end of season three of Trapped Under Plastic. Don't worry. We're going to be back for season four. We're going to be new and improved. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Uh, there'll be another year of references, <laughs> another year of uh, silly shirt designs. Hopefully, we'll have another one. The preamble ramble will continue to get just a minute longer every episode. Yeah, until it, it encompasses. It eats everything. <laughs> yeah. There is no topic. It's just preamble ramble. Yes. I mean, I would be fine with that, honestly. <laughs> so, but uh, we are going to see you around real soon as we finish up season three and look forward to season four and until then we catch you on the flippity flop